Well, this question of perennialism is increasingly of great importance to all Orthodox Christians. And so after a long a hiatus from addressing it, we've done this in the past, we've addressed it uh, at different conferences and different papers we've been delivered. We decided to bring it here to the Orthodox Ethos and the podcast. And we hope that all of our viewers, all those who've, many of you have uh, heard about it. Some of you have come to Orthodoxy or interested in the Orthodox Church through it. And uh, tonight's uh, presentation, I think, will be uh, of great interest to you. Uh, we, uh, as always, uh, have prepared a PDF uh, for you, and we're going to present that tonight. And that'll be available to all of the viewers who are members, uh, whether through our Patreon page or orthodoxitos.com or our YouTube channel or, or the uh, uh, Instagram uh, membership, uh, those four places, all of those uh, will have access to this PDF once it is uh, is uploaded. So if you like and you're interested in, in what you read and see tonight, you'll be able to access that uh, in the next few days. So let's jump right into it. Uh, let's begin uh, the discussion tonight, as usual, uh, with our PDF, and we'll put it on the screen. And as always, in our presentations here at Orthodox Theos, we want to stress that we are simply um, presenting what has been handed down to us. The holy tradition has come down to us. Uh, the uh, true traditionalists uh, in the world uh, are those who are handing down what's been revealed, what's been revealed by the Holy Fathers and passed down from the apostles and the fathers and the saints of all the ages. And so that's what we're doing, and that's why it is essential if you are to be an Orthodox Christian and desire to be in communion with all the saints that you follow the Holy Fathers. This is how all of the ecumenical councils began, following the Holy Fathers. Epomenes, disagias, patrasis. This is the essential and char characteristic of an Orthodox Christian. So uh, we like to quote Joseph Berenios, one of the great defenders of Orthodoxy in the uh, 15th century, 14th to 15th centuries. And he says, it is impossible to come to know the truth or to grasp theology in any other way, but by following the saints. Uh, and this is especially important for tonight's discussion, especially important. And we also have the witness of uh, a contemporary who also came to Orthodoxy, studying Genon, studying Shuan and others, thinking himself uh, at the time above all the traditions, in and yet above all the traditions, as he said. Uh, and he tells us, there is no problem of our own confused times which cannot find its solution by a careful and reverent reading of the Holy Fathers. And so, Father Seraphim, uh, we ask your intercessions tonight as we begin. Uh, and we're going to begin by an, an observation. Before we get to the question of perennialism, we want to put it to a short observation analysis of the beginnings, the time in which perennialism was born at the turn of the uh, 19th, 20th century, in the uh, early 1900s, especially at that time in the contemporary era when perennialism was born again, and the, particularly this school of uh, traditional traditionalism that we're going to be examining tonight, we want to put it in this right pers historical perspective, as we understand as Orthodox Christians. And so this is uh, this is our uh, our contribution to properly understanding how. Uh, and what, what the what the context was in which the contemporary, the modern movement of traditionalism or, or perennialism was born. Uh, and it is coming at the end of a long process, which we all have to keep in mind in order to properly understand uh, this phenomena, this uh, school of thought. Uh, it is a tried and constant tactic of the enemy of mankind's salvation in Christ to limit man's choices to two options, which are seemingly opposed, and to block from view any other possibility, or rule it out as impractical or untenable. For example, one is either rational or irrational, super rational not being an option, or 
One must be either blindly obedient or self-willed and rebellious, true obedience being rejected. Or on a larger scale, for the Africans, he presents a terrifying black magic and then for escape, a good white magic. Or for the impoverished masses, the greed of capitalism is countered and corrected by the equality and fraternity of communism. Or for those who suffered under the authoritarian rule of papal Protestantism, there is the self-rule and individualism of reformed Protestantism. And one could go on and list many other such false dichotomies in which both options are actually the enemy's inspiration. Even today with uh, the recent COVID crisis that we all faced globally, the accepted narrative states that the only solution to that deadly, so-called deadly virus is an experimental and potentially more deadly vaccine. Early treatment with existing medicines being largely ignored at the time. So we have many, many uh, examples of this uh, two options. There's only two options. We have to go to one or the other. And this is how the enemy puts men before two bad choices. In this way, the enemy has successfully manipulated Western man for many, many generations, especially Western man, but all of mankind, but especially Western man for our our discussion tonight, from the time of the Great Schism until today, keeping him within a constant series of actions and reactions, like a pendulum which ceaselessly, ceaselessly swings from one extreme to the next. All spiritual balance, the divine perspective, discernment of spirits, and the royal path of the fathers was lost. I'm going to read that again. Spiritual balance divine perspective, which comes with the ascent to the heights, discernment of spirits, which is the most characteristic, the char most, most characteristic of orthodoxy and the greatest of the virtues, and the royal path of the Father, which avoids the extremes and spots the false dichotomies, they were lost. They were largely, if not exclusively, entirely lost to Western man because of his loss of the grace of the divine energies that comes through the body of Christ and the mysteries. In this chaotic state, for those who don't have the eternal perspective or see the alpha and omega of history, it is impossible to determine where we are in the flow of history or where these events are leading us. For one who can see, however, this is a process of advancing dissolution which is bringing mankind step by step closer to the fulfillment of the mystery of iniquity, to the inversion of salvation in Christ and his supplanting by the Antichrist. This is all very relevant to our discussion about parentalism tonight. When you come back and you finish tonight's discussion and you want to come back, I suggest you re-listen or re-read what I just said in light of what we're going to present tonight with regard to parentalism. That this, this dissolution of Christian tradition and unity in the West and the resultant caricature of Christ and his church in Reformed, especially Reformed Protestantism, but also Papal. Again, whether Papal or Reformed, we are talking about a Protestantism. It constitutes the basis for the birth of the monster of modernity. Of course, traditionalism, perennialism, is a revolt against modernity. Right? This is a major cornerstone of the whole traditionalist thought. That rejecting and throwing off, many times rightly so, the monster of modernity. How did we get here? How did we get here? It was the dissolution of Christian tradition and unity. The resultant caricature of Christ and his body, the church, that brought about and was the basis of the birth of the monster of modernity. Very, very important if we're going to understand both the supposed solution, that is perennialism, offered as a solution for mankind, and also the, uh, w the reason why uh, the Western solutions are not solutions at all. By the end of the 19th century, 
the more robust minds in the West were searching, which were searching for a way out of the dead end of the modern secular West. Right? This is this is the milieu, milieu of the early 1900s and from which perennialism was born, right? They were searching for a way out of the dead end of the modern secular West. It looked to the tradition in the East, but alas, not to the Orthodox East, but to the Far East. Indeed, it is very characteristic, brothers and sisters, how little reference is made to Orthodoxy among these thinkers. Now, some of you who are already well-versed in this topic may be already familiar with a very interesting analysis and and uh, a kind of journalistic histor historians, uh, scholar and historians analysis of traditionalism. And you're familiar with this book, I'm sure. Let's see if we can get it in there. Against the Modern World, Traditionalism and the Secret Intellectual History of the 20th Century by Mark Sedgwick. He's also written another follow-up to this, which I have not read. Um, and, you know, many people have read this and are critics of it who are in the perennialist uh, traditional school. But in any case, uh, he does present the historical uh, uh, context uh, pretty well with a lot of interesting details about the, those who uh, were at the uh, epicenter. And this is what we saw. What we see historically is that these, we, these were uh, men searching for a way out. And yet you almost never encounter mention of orthodoxy in any real substantive way. And so it is a great tragedy that they were searching for a way out of the dead end of the Western secular reality. And they went to the East, but not to the Orthodox East. These traditionalists thought to save the West from collapse by means of injecting Oriental tradition and metaphysics as expressions of the perennial philosophy or the Sophia perennis, the juxtaposition of the straw man of modernist normal normalist Christianity a la Protestantism with the traditional cultures of the East is yet another example of the enemy's long list of false dichotomies which serve to keep man from communing with the truth incarnate. This is essential to understand this why it's in bold here. This is what again is presented. Oh you must choose between the Catholicism that Rene Guénon rejected, or the Protestantism that Chuan and others rejected. And you must go from there, and the only other choice is the Far East and the tradition, quote unquote, and the metaphysics that they found in the Far East. Yet unlike the previous extremes on the pendulum, which served to confine and manipulate the headless fragmented West, right? The previous extremes going back centuries upon centuries in the West, unlike the previous extremes on this pendulum, swinging and like a wrecking ball in the West for centuries, resulting in the French Revolution, resulting in the Enlightenment, resulting in materialism, right? One by one by one, destroying the unity the continuity of holy tradition, whatever remained after the departure, unfortunately, of the Pope from the union and unity of the church in the 11th century, step by step dissolving. And so we arrive today at the, uh, as it were, the end of history. We're looking forward toward the ascent of Antichrist uh, and many signs telling us that it's not far. So unlike the previous extremes, on the pendulum, which served to confine and manipulate a headless fragmented West, headless capital H. Perennialism promises to bring an end to the extremes and to provide the final universal answer to the problem of divisions, providing a unity, quote unquote, which is found at once both beyond all revelations and through them. Let me repeat that, very important. Perennialism promises to do what? To bring an end to the extremes that had been created in the West. To provide the final universal answer. Universalism, is it? perennialism is kind of universalism, right? So the final answer, the universal answer to the problem of divisions, we have the answer. 
the visions on one level, they remain, but they're only external. We have the internal unity, the esoteric unity of all religions. And it, it's supposedly providing a unity which is found at once both beyond all revelations, all traditions. Father well, Seraphim Rose said before he became Orthodox, I was above all traditions. I, I didn't, that wasn't limited because I knew I was initiated and through them, right? So they become conduits exoterically, but esoterically we have a unity that basically surpasses their limitations on the exoteric level. So what is this perennialism? What is this perennialism? Let's dial, let's step back now and let's look at this perennialism. It's very important, very important in the modern years, much underrated. I agree with Mark Sedgwick, Sedgwick, I think that's how we say his name, that it's it's the secret, or the not the secret history, because that sounds like it's some kind of conspiracy theory. It's the disregard, under, not understood, not readily apparent to the worldly uh, uh, materialist uh, West, but it's there and it's going to provide again, once again, the supposed solution to the dissolution, right? It's going to give us the unity with that supposedly humanity is really has, it's all there. We just need to uncover it. So that's all, you know, to the, to the, uh, 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 the, let's say, how can I say this? The Western man who has lost all spiritual insight, he doesn't see it, but it's there. So what is this perennialism? Generally understood and referenced, perennialism is the idea that at the core of all the great religions is found the same mystical experience of ultimate reality. The perennial philosophy has its historical roots in the syncretism of Renaissance humanists like Marsilio Ficino or Pico della Mirandola, who suggested that Plato, Jesus, the Kabbalah, and Hermes, Tris Megistos, were all pointing to the same divine reality. Versions of perennialism are also found in the transcendentalism of Emerson, Coleridge, and Thoreau. Freemasonry, the Theosophical Society, and Aldous Huxley's 1945 book, The Perennial Philosophy, further popularized a universalist version of perennialism. And in the 1960s, it became a cornerstone idea of the new age. All right, so that is a very brief introduction to the general idea of perennialism. But we're not going to talk about that general idea. We're going to, we want to talk about, in particular, what came in the wake of the work of René Guénon and also then carried on to a certain degree with Fritjof Schuon, although some say Guénon was not a real perennialist, at least not a perennialist like Schuon. It's not really of interest to us. We, we, we can debate that, but he definitely had a perennialism in his thought, uh, and certainly Schuon uh, uh, developed that quite a bit. What is of particular interest for us is the development of perennialism in the 20th century, and in particular as it was presented through the Vedanta-inspired traditionalist school, especially by René Guénon, who likely met perennialism during his years in the Masonic Lodge. We mentioned earlier that he left Catholicism. He left it for Masonry. In 1912, Guénon, searching outside of his local French Catholic milieu, received his sixth and final initiation in the regular Masonic Lodge, Theba. He was introduced to this lodge by Oswald Wirth, a central figure in the history of Masonic traditionalism. You see Guénon in his later years on the left. The thumbnail of this uh, live stream had him in his younger years. Here he is in his older years when he was meeting people like Guénon and, uh, and others like Martin Lings and, uh, uh, and others. Whereas Huxley and others embraced a mystical universalism, the traditional school, as represented by Genon, Ananda Kumaraswamy, he's the one 
here uh, in the tie on the left, underneath Chuan and Genon. The top picture here is Genon on, the, on your, let's see, my left, your right. Uh, and, uh, and, get, and then Chuan has the head covering. At a younger age there, probably, we're talking probably in the 1930s, I'm guessing, and maybe 40s, I don't know. And then you have Ling's underneath him, the older man with the beard. Uh, to his uh, uh, to his left, uh, our right, uh, as, as I'm looking at it on the screen, uh, is uh, is uh, Kumar Swami, although he was uh, in the picture we have for this foot, uh, thumbnail tonight, he is in a clerical garb. He is, uh, uh, underneath him uh, is Titus Burkhart and then Houston Smith. Uh, and so uh, the traditional school is represented by Genon, Shuan, Kumar Swami, Burkhart, Lings, Smith, and others, including those on the right among the Orthodox, believe it or not. There are men who became Orthodox through this school, the first two. On the right, the top one is Philip Sherard, uh, and under him is is James Cutsinger. Uh, and there's a whole discussion about that we're not going to have tonight about Sherard's perennialism and how much he rejected some of his earlier perennialist thoughts or not. But his last book, uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, his last book was certainly permeated by and certainly does embrace certain perennialist uh, philosophical ideas from Shuan and others, although he rejects others. Uh, it was entitled Christianity, Liniments of a Sacred Tradition, not the Sacred Tradition, but a Sacred Tradition, pointing to his views. Uh, James Kutzinger, who I knew personally and actually was a young uh, 20-something student uh, for a very brief time down in South Carolina back in 1994 or 5. Uh, well, actually, it would have been 90, yes, five. Uh, and we met a few times over the years. Uh, he was a committed perennialist. Um, although, again, I'm not sure toward the end of his life if he understood and rejected uh, perennialism or not. I uh, hope so, but uh, don't know that. Certainly didn't, never seen anything written by uh, Professor Kutzinger to that effect. And then under him is somebody who's commemorated by the perennialists and has written and, and, attended a few conferences, written a few things for this school, and is commemorated on their website, the Wisdom, uh, I forget what it's called, the website, and that is the Archdeacon of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, uh, John Christophe Gies, and he seems to be very supportive of Sherard's latest uh, last book, but uh, as far as his views on perennialism, they're much more limited, I'm not really familiar with, uh, and could not speak to his perennialism, but he is commemorated as someone who has contributed to the contemporary uh, intellectual scene of perennialism. That is a just a, by way of identification and not not any uh, analysis of any thought on the part of these men on the right. Now, getting back, these representatives of the school. This is what we're interested in in our particular talk tonight. And it's, again, it's a very introductory talk. This could this is a very very obviously very deep, and we could go on for weeks and weeks and weeks talking about perennialism and orthodoxy. Among these and others, the traditionalist school is oriented to orthodox tradition, small o, and rejects modern syncretism and universalism. It has its own version of universalism, not the modern popular version. It is this school that this paper, this talk tonight, will reference for the reason that their works have clearly gained more attention and traction among certain Orthodox academic theologians and clergy. That's why I have these pictures on the right for your uh, ease of, uh, of identifying some of those thinkers. There's more, there's more. The editors of the Philokalia in English, uh, Paul, Palmer and uh, Callisto Square were also influenced by Perennialism, not uh, not sure to what degree, but uh, they do seem to be influenced by perennialism and impressed by some of its reflections, as most academic theologians are. According to the traditionalist school, the perennial philosophy is absolute truth and infinite presence. 
as absolute truth. By the way, uh, let me say now that I have not included all of the footnotes and the references for a particular reason. Uh, this this paper, this presentation tonight, will be a part of the forthcoming title from Uncle Martin Press, which will include the vast majority of the papers and talks and lectures that I've given uh, in official academic circles going back 20 years. And so if you're interested in this talk tonight, you want to see all the references and the footnotes that this paper has, uh, I recommend uh, perhaps in, in two to three to four months, not really sure when we're going to get it out, but uh, it is a forthcoming title from Uncomathen Press. It included this talk and this essay, this paper tonight, and you'll see all of the references then. Uh, so we don't get bogged down in that and doesn't take up the screen. We've left it out of tonight's lecture. Quoting uh, a scholar here presenting uh, the whole school uh, as absolute truth, it is the perennial wisdom that stands as the transcendent source of all the intrinsically orthodox religions of mankind. All right, so that's their definition, their understanding. Right, this is the perennial wisdom that the transcendental source, right, the source beyond. What's what is that which is transcendent, right? Our, our world, our the exoteric, the immediate, right? The, the the transcendent source of all the intrinsically orthodox religions. That is the perennial wisdom, right? Absolute truth. It is as a truth. It is the perennial wisdom, right? So as infinite presence, now it is the perennial religion that lives within the heart of all intrinsically orthodox religions. It's precisely this soul religion, quote unquote, that Shuan, pictured on the left, uh, and one of the, the books about his life and teaches about him, has called the underlying religion, or the religion of the heart, which is the heart of all religions and which is of an essentially supra-formal, universal, or spiritual nature. In other words, the underlying religion, quote-unquote, remains transcendent vis-a-vis the religions, even while being a vivifying presence within them. Not a, we're basically unpacking what we've already said in their language, using their uh, analysis, these, these, their, their expressions. Thus, for the perennialist philosopher, Christianity is, as Clinton Minar writes, this is the book that he and Martin Ling's co-authored, that we're quoting from, very different, very clearly different from Islam or Buddhism qua form, as to the form, as to the external form, right? But it is one with them qua essence or qua perennial philosophy as to as to the essence as to the perennial philosophy it is one with them but very different in form okay it's kind of states what we've already under, pretty obvious but this is essential cornerstone to the to the perennialism especially what we're interested in, in terms of perennialism this is what we're interested in. what what this is what is going to be uh of great interest going forward for many people and it already is it should be immediately apparent what potential this understanding of the religions holds out for the unity of mankind, the quote unquote unity of mankind, but also for the lot of those who will reject this unity and insist on remaining with the unadulterated incarnate Christ. But here I am getting ahead of myself. Let me just. Uh, one second. A little bit. Oh, there we go. So it's very important that we understand the perennialist vision of things so we can spot it and discern it as being promoted even among some in the church. It can perhaps be better understood through a diagram. And this is the diagram that we're going to examine here. Picture the image of a circle with the absolute at the center, the esoteric domain, mysticism, gnosis, union. Right? 
several radii, radii flowing outward to the circumference, its radii being various revelations of God. All right, so in the center, we have the absolute. You see revelation, it says their revelation. These are various revelations coming out from the center of the absolute to the various religions. You have Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Chinese tradition, primal tradition, Judaism. Uh, the, the thinkers within perennialism and trad traditional school have identified what they believe to be the authentic religious uh, traditions carrying the, these revelations. Again, not really sure, uh, you know, on what basis they determine the criteria to determine which are true and which are false. Uh, that varies uh, to a certain degree. In any case, they have said that these religions are authentic, carrying the revelations of God. And so we have these coming out from the absolute center, going toward the religions, to the exoteric domain, from the esoteric to the exoteric domain, right? With paths also returning to him from these traditions and religions, right? In whom they are transcendently united, right? So they're united in the absolute through the uh, revelations, esoterically different, esoterically united. Uh, the religions, although united at the core, are posited around the edge of the circumference, exoteric domain, the forms, the dogma, the ritual, the dogma is also included. As exoteric and not in the ex essence, uh, the essential in the center, right? That's where they posit the religions and their forms and their ritual and their dogma, each separate and distant from the other, right? So Islam is distant from Christianity, is distant from Judaism. Uh, and so the esoteric domain, initiation, contemplation, metaphysics, mysticism, gnosis, universality, realization, deliverance, union. These things are the esoteric domain, the exoteric domain, forms, observance, piety, you know, morality, dogma, ritual, exclusivism, salvation, salvation. All right, so that is, uh, I think, very helpful, hopefully, right? From this diagram, one can see that Central to the perennialist theory is the question of esotericism and exotericism in each religion. Perennialist doctrine teaches that each religion has a formal institutional aspect, which is the respective religion's exoteric aspect, where they differ most profoundly, and each religion has an esoteric aspect, which exists in the spiritual methods of the religions, where they seem to draw closer together and may even reach a point of identity. We will examine this idea further on after first briefly presenting other aspects of the perennialist outlook. All right, so keep, keep that in mind as we go and look at some other parts of the perennialist outlook. The perennialist view of religion turns on the axiomatic notion of multiple and diverse revelations which, quote, crystallize and, quote, actualize in different degrees, according to the case, a nucleus of certitudes, which abides forever in the divine omniscience. All right, let's read it again. It's pretty core to understand. What is the perennial's view of religion? Well, it turns on this very important notion of multiple and diverse revelations, right? Multiple and diverse revelations. Right there on the page there, you see this uh, described, you have the contemplative forms, uh, at the top there, the experience of God, the absolute, right? And coming out and also going toward, you have the institutional forms. All right, so there are multiple and diverse revelations. There's not just one revelation, Jesus Christ, right? There are multiple revelations to different, in, in the different religions. These revelations crystallize and actualize in different degrees according to the case a nucleus of certitude so there's there's a there's certitudes there's the absolute right the that which we know for sure and and it and they are um in differing degrees they're they're actualized and crystallized uh in the revelations and these this nucleus of certitudes 
abides forever in the divine omniscience. All right. So all of this for us as Orthodox begs the question. I'm cutting to the chase. There's a very large topic here, very extensive analysis one could make. I want to get to some certain points that we're going to make from Orthodox perspective. Begs the question, what is the compelling reason that God wills multiple revelations of himself? Why? Why should we believe that? Why is that such a compelling thing? Why do we have to accept that? Which are manifestly divergent and apparently opposed. Right? Why would one God feel it necessary to have manifestly divergent and apparently opposed on a very on many levels, most people believe that these things are opposed. There is irreconcilable. Most people, except the perennialists who are, you know, initiated into this great, amazing knowledge that all the, you know, simple uh, human humanoids cannot grasp, right? The great thinkers, the great initiates are telling us, yes, it appears to be externally opposed, apparently opposed, manifestly divergent. So, but, but the question is why? Why would God do that, right? So there has to be a reason, and there is a reason given by Joff Shuan. And that is that humanity's divisions require it, right? So God is now required because of our divisions to do this. Our divisions, humanity's divisions, you know, which we would maybe in the biblical uh, uh, narrative, we would point to Tower of Babel to you know the effects of sin and uh, and the division of humanity uh, and then languages and then cultures and then coming down to us we have all uh, great divisions among all different kinds of cultures and, and and peoples and so he says humanity is divided into several distinct branches uh, i would say well, several but maybe even many more than just several but okay, several distinct branches each with its own peculiar traits, psychological or and otherwise, which determine its receptivities to truth and shape its apprehension of reality. All right, so these branches have particular traits, and this determines, they are determined because of this divided, uh, distinct branches, they're, they're, the reality of their existence det determines makes it essentially required that they have different types of receptivity to truth and and this these things shape their very apprehension of reality so that's pretty that's that's a pretty amazing thing to think about like that uh demands uh the fruit of division the fruit of all this demands God has to work within that and has to come down and, and has to appear in different ways, divergent, opposed, apparently, to different people to suit their needs. To these diverse branches, then, God addressed diverse revelations which were shaped by the peculiarities of each grouping of humanity, right? So very interesting. Very, very much not a Christian concept, by the way. <clears throat> this is not a Christian idea. Christians have not embraced this at all. In fact, we have something that totally opposes it, which we'll talk about in a minute. What determines <clears throat> what determines the differences among forms of truth in the difference among uh, what determines the differences among forms of truth is the difference among human receptacles. All right, so that's the human receptacles are determining the differences among the forms of truth. For thousands of years already, humanity has been divided into several fundamental, fundamentally different branches, which constitute so many complete humanities, more or less closed in on themselves. The existence of spiritual receptacles so different and so original demands differentiated refractions of the one truth. This is uh, quoting, I think, Shuan here, uh, or at least uh, his, a commentary on Shuan representing his views. I don't have the paper in front of me to, to to cite exactly who's saying that, but that is definitely expressing very much the perennialist thought. So therefore, the perennialists hold that God has assigned 
each of the great world religions to a specific sector or race of humanity. And each is fully true in the sense that it provides its adherents with everything they need for reaching the highest or most complete human state. So God is behind all the great world religions. He has created them. He has assigned them to different sectors uh, of humanity. And in them and through them, he provides everything they need to reach the highest, most complete human state. All right? That is the cornerstone of the Perenno's view and very, very important going forward for uh, the uh, spiritual uh, future of the world as, as in terms of the the uh, coming unity that is being shaped and being formed. This idea of God distributing revelations of himself tailor-made for subsections of humanity, right? This idea, so crucial to the entire perennialist outlook, comes into contradiction to the plain witness of salvation history, beginning with the day of Pentecost at which the curse of Babel was overturned and the unity of all the races of men was actualized in Christ. All right, so slams into Pentecost, this vision, absolutely irre irreconcilable with the totality, the Catholicity of Pentecost. In Christ, the, quote, dividing wall was overcome and so many humanities were united sharing as they do the one human nature which Christ put on, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. It is a great tragedy, as you see on the screen, that the contemporary leader of Catholicism has embraced perennialism in this respect, calling it God's will, famously calling it God's will, that there is religious pluralism. It is God's will there are many religions very much consistent with the perennial's vision. And there are, I think, more than we realize, more thinkers in Catholicism and even some in Orthodoxy who are very much committed to ecumenism who would agree and support these views of perennialism. Father George Florovsky writes the following that totally frees us and orients us properly to the proper Christian vision with regard to this question and shows the absolute irreconcilability of the Christian vision with the perennialist vision. The church is completeness itself. It is the continuation and the fulfillment of the theanthropic union. The church has transfigured and regenerated mankind. The meaning of this regeneration and transfiguration is that in the church, mankind becomes one unity in one body. The life of the church is unity and union. The body is knit together and increaseth in unity of spirit, in unity of love. The realm of the church is unity. Right? As we go forward, it should be obvious that the kind of unity that is presented by perennialism and this, the kind of disunity on the exoteric level, which is supposed to be God's will and God's design for humanity, is totally irreconcilable with the church's understanding and experience of unity in Christ. And of course, as Father Florovsky goes on, Father George says, of course, this unity is no outward one, but is inner, intimate, organic. Does that mean it's not also outward? No, he's not saying that. It's not, he's saying it's not simply an outward, but it's also, an, it's also outward. It has to be outward, obviously, because it is manifest, and it is manifest in time and space, and that is the implication of the incarnation. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It is the unity of the living body, the unity of the organism. Obviously, that's an external reality. The church is a unity, not only in the sense that it is one and unique. It is a unity, first of all, because it is very, its very being consists in reuniting separated and divided mankind. 
Right? So far from this divided and separated mankind that's presented as God's will and allowed by God and work and God works in spite of it and 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 allows for it and says let let that external disunity be and uh, we'll work around that. Uh, it is it is a uh, it is a unity. First of all, because it's very being consists in reuniting separated and divided mankind. It is this unity which is the sobernost or Catholicity of the Church. And here is the most important. In the church, humanity passes over into another plane, begins a new manner of existence. All right. So uh, in the church, we have a true unity. And that unity is both, of course, internal and external. Because it's found in the manifestation of the body and in the Eucharist and in the mysteries, which are not simply on an esoteric level, uh, but also exoteric. From the religious studies departments to the departments of state and increasingly to the departments of theology and hierarchy, the respectability and the acceptability of the perennial philosophy has in many ways made it to the ruling spiritual philosophy, made it the ruling spiritual philosophy of our time. Well-known intellectuals have either been heavily influenced by it or have joined its ranks. Everyone from Ken Wilbur to John Taverner to Prince Charles, you see John Taverner and Prince Charles here in the picture from many years ago. Prince Charles, who was, who is, and what, or was rather a famed pilgrim to Vato Petty Monastery in Mount Athos. So he's coming and visiting the center of orthodoxy, but unfortunately has never understood and entered into the orthodox way of life and church but has been very committed to his perennialism the view that god wills multiple revelations and once was once found only among the scholar devotees of the perennialist it is now being expressed and shared by the most senior representatives of christianity and islam in february of 2019 pope francis and the grand imam of al azhar Ahmed El Tayeb, I'm probably butchering that, forgive me, signed a document on human fraternity for world peace and living together during a global conference on the topic in Abu Dhabi. Dhabi, I don't know how to say that. It is in this common declaration a major tenet of perennialism was stated. He said, they said together, the pluralism and the diversity of religions. Color, sex, and race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom. All right, so the diversity of religions is willed by God in his wisdom. Very much, as we said earlier, consistent with perennialism. So this is what's happening, brothers and sisters, is moving far beyond uh, the refined and limited uh, discussion in the parlors and the salons of France and and uh, and Paris and uh, and uh, Italy and you know Cairo that we observed uh, in this intellectual history uh, of back in the day of Genon and Shuan, but now it's being uh, as, as these things tend to do, they're trickling down to the, the more gross level of politicians and and diplomats, including ecclesiastical diplomats, and so we see this influence of perennialism not being limited to the leaders of the heterodox, but unfortunately, orthodox leaders have expressed themselves in identical terms, practically quoting from the works of Shuan or Kumar Swami, to quote a well-known archbishop of the ecumenical patriarchate who recently spoke to an inter-religious gathering. He said, when you elevate one religion above all the others, it is as if you decide there is only one path leading to the top of the mountain. But the truth is, you simply cannot see the myriads of paths that lead to the same destination, because you are surrounded by boulders of prejudice that obscure your view. And so, indeed, we have here with this ecclesiastical leader a very clear expression of Shuan's famous uh, imagery and the, very much at the heart of perennialism that there are many paths up the mountain 
and those paths go through the various religions. And there's not one religion above others because there is a unity of all the religions and the paths are all leading to the top of the mountain. This is exactly what is presented by the perennialist. And so unfortunately uh, for some ecclesiastical leaders, they, they have fallen off the Orthodox cart and hit, them, hit, hit themselves as it were in the head with the contemporary delusions of the uh, <clears throat> school of traditionalism. It is hard to conceive of a statement more in line with perennialism and the spirit of the age and more baseless and at odds with the phronema of the saints of God, the true initiates into the life of the Holy Trinity, than this comment we just quoted. The equality of religions and their esoteric unity and their salvific paths leading from the exoteric to the absolute, the hallmarks of perennialism are all here. Again, the equality of religions, their esoteric unity, their salvific paths, they're all here in this comment. What is, however, of even more particular interest for us is the identification of fidelity to Christ, the only way to the Father, with bigotry and prejudice. So not only does he say, and the, the, the many say today, uh, well, there's this esoteric unity, you know, of course, and you know, the, the many paths up the mountain, but the fact that you would doubt that and oppose it means there's only one thing that could mean, and that you are a gross bigot. You are prejudiced. You are blinded by passions and arrogance, right? That's a very interesting message. It's not going to stay in the realm of the departments of religion, but this is going to be applied uh, in the halls of government and uh, international law uh, very much. We can one can expect that, and that's what our contemporary saints and scholars say. Indeed, this brings to mind the judgments of two well-known Orthodox apologists, Father John Romanides in response to the Balamand Agreement, and Father Daniel Sisoyev, and his prediction of the future of Orthodox mission and persecution. Let's start with Father John Romanides. What does he say regarding the Balaman Agreement? Now, the Balaman Agreement was this idea that we all have common, Orthodox and the Papal Protestants, the Roman Catholics, have common mysteries. And, uh, and we already are united in the mysteries. And essentially, we're, uh, we're one church, but divided. Okay, that was the Balaman Agreement. Of course, Father John Romanides, in his ecclesiology, being faithful to the Father, says this is absurd, this is a nonsense. Uh, you should go on and read it uh, for your own. If you've not read his response to the Balaman Agreement, it's worth your time. And he says, after, I'm paraphrasing here, after the Orthodox at Balaman fell into delusion and extended the full recognition of Latin sacraments, Father John perceptively recognized that going forward, given this recognition, the only plausible explanation for the continual refusal by the Orthodox of intercommunion and concelebration would be bigotry. Right? You can't understand. The minute you accept that there are common mysteries, common church, why is there any opposition to unity? Why is there not immediate concelebration and immediate intercommunion? Well, it can't be for any theological, dogmatic reason. Right? It can't be for any spiritual reason. It must be for political reasons. It must be for diplomatic reasons. It must be for because, well, not everybody agrees. And uh, But certainly if it's Christ given and giving himself in every mystery, and you recognize the mysteries happening there, not only here, well, there is here. Christ is one in the mysteries, and now Christ is there and here. So we, we are one in Christ. And therefore, why oppose it? Well, you must be a bigot. What else is there, right? You must be a bigot. You've already uh, shown yourself to be a bigot. And that's exactly what this archbishop uh, implied, not just between Roman Catholics, Papal Protestants, and Orthodox, but indeed all the religions. So really, at the core, there's not much difference between what happened in Balamand and what is happening and happened in Dubai with the Pope and the Muslim leader. Even more insightful than Father John Romanides are the statements by Father Daniel, the new martyr, the great missionary. He has great missionary experience, and his experience in preaching and teaching the faith to many heterodox, including more than 80 Muslim converts, which were made through his work, led him to see clearly the nature of the approaching persecution. 
The challenge coming will not be for Christians to deny the divinity of Christ outright. Perennialism is not asked that. In fact, it supports the idea that Christ, that the Logos, is working through Christ, the man, and such uh, heretical ideas. But it doesn't deny that uh, there is divinity. It's not going to ask the Christians. This spirit, this this uh, philosophy, this school of thought, it's not going to ask Christians to deny Christ. No. The demand will be, rather, for Christians to accept the non-Christian religions as equally salvific path to the one God, of course. Don't deny Christ, but accept the religions as equally salvific paths. Otherwise, you are a bigot. And you know what we do with bigots, don't you? The Christians will be divided. The Christians, the Orthodox Christians, he says, will be divided here. And this is always a sign of the work of the enemy. That he divides and conquers. The Christians will be divided. The fruit of this is the divisions of Christians. Do we need, how many witnesses do we need to show that this is not of God, right? Christians will be divided. And those accepting the proposition, uniting in this way with the religions, and those refusing being persecuted, uh, those refusing being persecuted as bigots and dangerous to societal peace and security. So the division of Christians will result in two groups. One, accepting the proposition and having peace in community. In community. And in this way, they will be uniting with the religions. And then there'll be the other Christians, the, the so-called bigots, who will refuse this proposition. And they will be dangerous to society and societal unity going forward. So let's talk about and do and give a, a brief orthodox analysis of the perennialist vision that's coming down to us and is becoming more and more popular and and just absorbed, just kind of just kind of breathed in by the populace, right? Not because they're studying in the uh, Yale or Harvard or Paris or Cairo or anywhere, but they're just it's now arriving at the level of the popular and the, uh, the you know vision and and there's variety of visions and variety of versions. It's not so important, right? Uh, it's now uh, being being disseminated throughout the the world uh, on a very popular level. What can one say in this limited time about the perennial's outlook? Well, firstly, with regard to the question of knowledge, nociology, epistemology, we can it can be observed the following: that although it is held that esoteric insights must be gained a posteri posteri Theory, they are assumed a priori, right? It must be gained, of course, by experience. But these esoteric insights are assumed from the beginning because it's impossible, obviously, for one to have experience of all the religions. So there is no empirical knowledge that is at work here to give us these great insights of Shuan and others. So what is essentially pure, rational speculation on the part of the writer, since he cannot, as I said, by definition, have a personal experience of every religion, is posited with exceptional but unjustified confidence. Pride. Pride. This is the defining characteristic of every heretic. And so Luciferic pride. When I was at Essex Monastery 20 years ago, 1996, I was sitting with a monk there who had been a part of the Shuan uh, order in Bloomington, Indiana. And he spoke to me as I was very interested then, having just come from South Carolina and my time with James Kutzinger. And he was very interested to sit down and talk to him. He's now, I think, Maybe he's so alive, I don't know. Maybe he's reposed, but he left the monastery a few years later. But he had passed through uh, Shuan's uh, order, Sufi order, which really became the conduit for perennialism after after Gennon. Even though Gennon was not apparently supportive at the end of his life of Shuan, that's another question. Anyway, he sat and he told me very something very interesting. This was his insight, this was his experience. He was brought to Orthodoxy by Elder Sophroni, Saint Sophroni now, uh, and brought out of the perennialist delusion. And he said uh, to me then, I was a layman, he said, look, 
what you have here are very, very intelligent men, extremely gifted in intelligence. And spiritually, what's going on here is not unlike what happened to Lucifer himself. In other words, they have such uh, powerful intellects, they become enamored and taken and essentially um, trust immensely their own intellectual power uh, that they worship it and they no longer worship God. They attribute to themselves, just like Lucifer did, the origin of that great light that he reflected. And they fall into this immense pride. They see things, of course, many things. And they're Many things are true, but it's one thing on the level of ideas to see truth. Another thing to have a communion with the person of truth, very different things, very different things. And the spirit of Python that we see in the Acts of the Apostles is at work in the world so much today, including with perennialism. So there are many people who come to Orthodoxy through perennialism and they say, there's so much truth there. Yes on the level of the created, on the level of the intellect of the great thinkers, that does not save, that does not initiate truly into an experience of truth as incarnate, truth as a person. All right, so a little footnote from my own personal experience, having spent 30 years, 25 years, very interested in this topic because of my experience, partly my experience with James Cutsinger 25 years ago. So there's an immense pride. And this pure rational speculation on the part of the writer, because he cannot, as we said, by definition, have the experience of these religions, personal firsthand, is posited with exceptional but unjustified confidence. Moreover, the religious perspectives represented by perennialist apologists are almost exclusively non-Christian, especially non-Orthodox, with one or two exceptions. This does not prevent them from assuring their readers that essentially, esot esoterically, the way of prayer, purification, and communion are really similar, if not identical, across the religious landscape. It is very convenient for perennialism that the unity, quote-unquote, of religions lies beyond the esoteric, exoteric dividing line. And thus is a reality that can never be empirically confirmed since each adherent must remain within his own religious tradition. Kind of reminds somebody of evolution <laughs> and the impossibility of ever showing one empirically how it's true. It is ultimately then a matter of trust in the perennialist masters, just like it's a matter of trust in the religion of evolution. And one observes that even high profile converts to orthodoxy retain high levels of trust in them. I'm talking about Phil Sherrard, for instance, or James Kutzinger, such that orthodoxy is viewed through the prism of perennialism and not the other way around. Unfortunately, this is what we observe. These converts, and there are not a few of them who come to orthodoxy through perennialism, cannot shake perennialism. And they remain trapped and limited thinking that they're oftentimes still very advanced and still very informed by perennialism. And yet that arrogance that is and has to be there, it's a part of the trust, right? And is what is obscuring their vision and obstructing their spiritual progress. So this trust in the perennialist masters, for all of you who are coming from perennialism, you must shake it. You must kill it if you're going to have true trust in the incarnate logos and his servants and his beloved. Now, we should ask, is the sharp contrast between exoteric and esoteric even legitimate? Is that even legitimate from the Christian perspective, Orthodox Christian perspective? From the Orthodox Christian patristic tradition and experience of God, do we have any basis to make such a sharp distinction between the forms and the spirit? Orthodox realism does not allow us to separate the flesh, the logos put on, with the spirit, the logos set, in which descends upon the forms of bread and wine to transform them into the body and blood, which sits now where? At the right hand of the Father. Let me repeat that. Orthodox realism 
does not allow us to separate the flesh the Logos put on with the spirit the Logos sent, and which descends upon the forms of bread and wine to transform them into the body and blood, which now sits at the right hand of the Father. Indeed, the transformation of these as exoteric forms by the spirit into life eternal takes place beyond the exoteric, exoteric dividing wall where we, still in the flesh, ascend. Where is divine liturgy? Where is the Eucharist? It's in heaven. Where we ascend in the divine liturgy, beyond that dividing wall, that's where the transformation of these exoteric forms by the spirit into life eternal take place. There's no division between the forms and the spirit here. It is precisely the scandalous particularity of the incarnation and the eternal identity of the Logos with the flesh he assumed that is the stumbling block for the religions of the world and sets the body of Christ apart as heaven on earth and no religion at all. In the person of Christ, the esoteric absolute was made manifest in exoteric form. For he that has seen Christ has seen the Father. John 14, 9. And through him we have access by one spirit unto the Father. Let me repeat that. In the person of Christ, the Logos sarks again and though. In the person of Christ, the esoteric absolute, beyond the pale, after the, what, you know, remember, the, remember the imagery of parentalism, the esoteric absolute was made manifest. It's not, it's not lost beyond the clouds. It's made manifest in exoteric form. For he that has seen Christ has seen the Father. And through him we have access by one spirit unto the Father. We have no eyewitnesses, brothers and sisters, of the Logos who attest to his being in the form of a book, let alone the Quran. But rather, he, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Contrary to the theories of the perennialists, the experience of the religion of the religion, especially Islam, is not that of a canonic God, who being found in the appearance as a man, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That is not the vision of any form of Islam. That is, we do not have a canonic God in Islam. Contrary, likewise, to the perennialist idea of a limited, or any other religion for that matter, contrary, likewise, to the perennialist idea of a limited economy of salvation in Christ. A limited economy, right? Each people, there's these divisions that forces God to have different, different religions and revelations. No, contrary to this limited economy of salvation in Christ, to one sector of humanity, and to a limitation of the name of the incarnate logos to the exoteric sphere, and even to only a portion of that sphere. We preach a crucified Christ who God has also highly exalted and given the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and those on earth, of those in heaven and those on earth, of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess, every tongue above, below, within, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Sarks again at all. Christ became, took on flesh. The Logos took on flesh. That Jesus Christ is the Lord, the glory of God the Father. There is no division here, brothers, is between the Logos and the Logos Sarks again at all. The Logos, the, the pre incarnate, the fleshless Logos, and the flesh that Christ took on now sits at the right hand of God the Father. There's no division. They want us to have. And imagine some kind of division so we can now have room for the various religions. There is no division. In Christ's body, the church, we have the unity of the earth and the heavens, of time and eternity, of the origin of revelation and the manifest truth, of the absolute and the finite. Since the logos became and remained sucks, remained sucks, right? Flesh. The exoteric personal mode of God is at once. The esoteric higher mode of God. This is so important. So important. 
Do you want to avoid the coming delusion that will be fed us, fed us and served up by the next stage of ecumenism, the final stage of ecumenism? Do you want to avoid that and remain faithful? You've got to understand this right here. Since the Logos became and remained flesh, Sarx, the exoteric personal mode of God is at once the esoteric higher mode of God. Sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Since the Logos became flesh and the flesh put on Christ, the exoteric world ceased to be a qualified reality. The Logos became flesh and sits at the right hand of God. The Logos, which became flesh, rather, and sits at the right hand of God, came and will come again to judge all men. That's who will come again to judge all men. The one with the wounds, the one who was pierced, the one who was crucified, he will come on the clouds and judge all men, not a portion of humanity, but all men, all religious men. He will be the judge of all men, and not just a sector of humanity. Not on the basis of an esoteric, mystical, hidden spiritual law, but on the basis of his commandments. They will be judged on the basis of his commandments, not on the basis of some esoteric, hidden spiritual law that is proposed within perennialism. And these commandments have been given for all men of all times to live by and in. We don't live by only, but we live in the commandments. The commandments are not created forms, but uncreated divine energies. The commandments are uncreated divine energies, and you have to live in them and by them, and you will be judged whether you have Christ, not I, but Christ who lives in me. That is the standard, not some esoteric, hidden, mystical law, uh, spiritual law. All right. Why does the rise of perennialism signal the end of ecumenism? Why does the rise of perennialism signal the end of ecumenism? So by now it should be apparent that with perennialism we do not have ecumenism in the usual popular sense. For the unity of these philosophers speak, the unity these philosophers speak of exists only on the transcendental plane, right? The transcendent plane. That of God, who is the transcendent unity of himself. Hence, they are not working towards a manifest unity in truth, like we see in the World Council of Churches, for instance. If we see that, if that's even lip service is paid. As, uh, as we see supposedly in modern ecumenism, for the simple reason that they already recognize this unity as existing on the esoteric transcendent plane. And do not wish for, let alone see any need for it, on the manifest exoteric imminent plane. In fact, they say, don't. Don't try to, no syncretism, please. No unity on the exoteric plane. There's no need. That's nonsense, right? They, they fight against that syncretism, which, you know, rightfully, we have to admit that they do not, they're not syncretists in that sense. The exoteric forms must remain, for each religion, separate. And so there's no need for an exoteric, external, manifest unity for the perennialist. This is key. This is why the end of ecumenism, as we know it, is at the doors with the, with the assumption and the promulgation of perennialism. Right? It's that, that whole model is done. It's over. People are going to say, well, gonna, there's going to be a lot of very confused, even Orthodox Christians who say, well, that's, this is ecumenism. This is not a threat to us. We, this is not an issue. We hear this all the time. Even Orthodox priests say, oh, ecumenism, no, WCC, it's old. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're right. But that's not ecumenism alone, right? It's not limited to that. And it's moving on. And it's going, and it's being be applied to the religions of the world. Pay attention. What the Pope did with his Muslim friend in Dubai is just one of many such manifestations of the new perennialist vision of unity. The impossible task of creating a divinely beautiful mosaic uh, of the body of Christ from the many shattered pieces of Protestantism, both papal and reformed, will shortly finally be abandoned. It's already been abandoned, but it'll be totally abandoned. The end of ecumenism, as we know it, is in sight. The unity, so-called, 
the world seeks will be found in perennialism's transcendent unity of religions, right? We are one. We don't need to manifest it in forms, ex exoteric forms. We already are one in the religious experience. And this unity will be experienced as a grave temptation which will visit the church worldwide, for it will obscure in order to set aside the theanthropic person of Jesus Christ and his body, the church. I'm going to read that again. This unity, so-called, will be experienced as a grave temptation for all true Christians, right? Which will visit the church worldwide. This idea, oh, I'll, I'll be safe if I'm in this jurisdiction, in this part of the world. If I'm on, in Greece, in northern Greece, in next to Mount Athos, I'll, I'm on Mount Athos. I'll be safe. There'll be no problem for me. Is delusional. It will be a worldwide phenomenon for everyone in the church all across the world. This unity will be a grave temptation coming upon all inhabitants of the earth. But it will obscure, and this is the ultimate denial, open, ultimate temptation, right? It will obscure in order to set aside entirely. No, 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 we don't, we don't want you to deny his divinity. No, no, you're setting aside. The minute you say we must say there are many mountains, many paths up the mountain, we are setting aside Christ as the manifestation of the Father, as the one only through him, the Christ incarnate, the Logos, Sarx, a genital. He is the one who has manifest the Father, and through him and in him we are with in communion with the Father. That is, if he's obscured, if he is obscured in a perennialist way, he is set aside. And they're going to set aside the theanthropic person of Jesus Christ and his body, the church. This is also very essential. Why do we talk so much on this channel and everybody who's struggling with Orthodox talks so much about ecclesiology? Because it's all about Christ. The body of Christ, the setting aside of the body of Christ, the uniqueness of the body of Christ, which is happened and is happening, has been happening for centuries in the West, such that they are totally defeated in this realm, outside of orthodoxy, right? That is one and the same defeat of the theanthropic person and image of Jesus Christ. They are inseparable. Christ and his body are inseparable. They go together. So obscuring the person of Christ, whether in his person, in history, or whether in the body of Christ in history, they are the same result, same grave temptation. This will be the last temptation of history. It has been prophesied by Christ himself in the book of Revelation. He says there, thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The Lord said this in Revelation 3.10. Our great elder, Athanas Mateleneos, tells us, because this temptation will affect the entire world, it will be, therefore, the great adulteration of faith in the theanthropic person of Christ. And perennialism, ecumenism, in the form of perennialism, is going to bring this great temptation, is bringing it already at the doors for many Orthodox Christians. And you see there are already hierarchs who have succumbed to it. Apocalyptic events are on the horizon. Of course, time, we do not know. We never talk about days and hours. Only God knows that. But we can see the signs of the times. Just as the last generation of men will cry out for peace and security precisely due to their lacking it, and then the sword will fall, men who are now crying out for unity, indeed, universal unity, precisely because they lack it. We'll find it in perennialism, which gives them this unity almost effortlessly. You don't have to do anything. You're already united. Without the cross, without crucifixion of the mind. Unity is already there. No crucifixion, no cross, no denial, no repentance. We already are unified. Like communism, which could not satisfy the longing of men due to its negative, repressive orientation, modernism, syncretistic ecumenism, does not satisfy men's longing for a deeper, mystical unity of each man and mankind 
as a whole. It is not going to happen. It's going to be superseded. It is a matter of time. Mankind will demand a robust, traditional, and universally acceptable explanation appealing to Orientals, right? The East has to buy it, right? That's why it's got to come from the East. It's got to have the whole of humanity buying into this. Mankind will demand a robust, traditional, we have a school of traditionalism here. We have the perennial tradition coming down to us. A traditional, not a modernist, not a newfangled, a traditional and universally acceptable explanation of how religion does not divide but unites mankind. We have to have that which is going to be very persuasive to those in the East and West, to the old and the new, to the old world and the new world. This is it. It's going to bridge those gaps. It's going to be this unity on this esoteric level. It's already there. Perennialism is poised to be the theoretical justification of many Christians, even quote unquote orthodox, for the essential, if not transcendent and esoteric unity of religions under the Antichrist. I'm going to say that again. Perennialism is poised to be the theoretical justification of many Christians for the essential, if not transcendent and esoteric unity of religions under the Antichrist. Finally, this pendulum that we talked about when we began this lecture, this pendulum that has destroyed like a wrecking ball holy tradition in the West, it has ceased its swinging. We are arriving at the 12th hour of history. No more, no more need to destroy. It's done. They've destroyed it all in the West. The heart of the night of this world. We're arriving here at the 12th hour, the heart of the night of this world, right? The last days of the Antichrist. We don't know when. Time, signs are many. We'll see. We're arriving. It's coming. When, what happens? The disciples sleep. We see that. Unfortunately, many, many disciples are asleep. They're not paying attention. They're not vigilant. God help us to all be vigilant. When the disciples sleep and traitors betray. And the incarnate Christ, the crucified one, is set aside for a crossless Savior. We are arriving at this 12th hour of history, brothers and sisters. Traitors are betraying, disciples are sleeping. The incarnate Christ, Logos, Sarx, Egeneto, this one, the only one, the Logos, that will come again to judge the living and the dead. The Logos is at the right hand of the Father, the Logos who has the marks in his hands. The only, one and only Logos who has flesh. This one is being betrayed. He's being set aside. The crucified one, right? No unity, no need to be crucified. No crucifixion necessary for this unity. The crucified one is being set aside for the crossless Savior. Who is the crossless Savior? Of course, the man of iniquity. Of course, the Antichrist. Hope you enjoyed and I hope it's been beneficial for you. This look from an Orthodox perspective at the whole question of perennialism. Obviously, we did not treat the entire topic. Obviously, we looked at what we wanted to look at. We wanted to get to the heart of the temptation that is presented by this particular form of perennialism, this, this school of thought, and the implications of what they're saying about who Christ is, what the church is, what the world is, where the religions are. And we believe this is where we're headed. God help us and save us in these days. And that is the end of our presentation. We'll open it up for questions. Happy to hear your questions. Welcome to Patricia Gray. Glad that you're joining us. Welcome to Bob Jones, God bless you. First one I see here from DM, I wanna tell everybody over there in Crowdcast, happy to see your questions, throw your questions on the Crowdcast chat there. Everybody else here, uh, hopefully we have uh, tonight questions coming from 
both. We've got Facebook, we got YouTube, but apparently we don't have questions coming in from the other platforms. Is that is that normal? I guess that is, unfortunately. If you have questions from other platforms and we don't, for some reason, can't have them here, I'm not sure what the technological issue is, you can send them to our Telegram chat and one of our coworkers will bring them over. Or possibly, if you're on Orthodox Ethos, you can do the same, orthodoxethos.com. Possibly in Orthodox Ethos, you can put your questions as well, and we can get to those. Hopefully, we can get over those. Uh, you can send them by email, team at orthodoxethos.com. If you have a really burning question, we can't see them because you're on a uh, platform, for whatever reason, doesn't show up here. Uh, try those out and see what we can do. All right, first question. Why do you think Genon and Shuan both convert to Sufi Islam as a reaction to the modern world as opposed to coming to Eastern Orthodoxy? That's a great question. And as I said earlier on in this uh, presentation, there's almost no mention, very, very limited mention of uh, Orthodoxy in this uh, examination, historical and uh, somewhat philosophical examination of, uh, of the school of perennialism, the school of traditionalism. Uh, and... Uh, very very late coming to this uh, uh, orthodoxy is very late. Uh, I would say in the last 30 years, there are people coming to orthodoxy because of perennialism. Uh, and so it doesn't really play a role in early uh, perennialism at all. It's not even on the horizon. It doesn't, it does not pay much attention to. I have not seen, I don't remember anyway, when I read, I read this 15 years ago, it's been a while. I just picked it up again for this talk. Um, I don't remember any particular reasons. I think there was some contact on the part of Shuan. I think Genon almost zero contact. Genon went from uh, growing up in French Catholicism. He actually married a devout uh, uh, Catholic, even though uh, it's kind of interesting in here. They're talking about his early days. And it says, uh, um, let's see, uh, he was uh, using opium and hashish uh, during his early days as a young man, 1910, 12. Uh, he married a devout Roman Catholic, um, and uh, I, I do not remember what happens to her and how she deals with it. Uh, I don't know if they if their marriage lasts. I don't. I didn't pay attention, um, frankly. But uh, maybe she converted. But in any case, those personal issues are actually what you're looking for. Why on those personal levels? Right. That's where a lot is 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 explained. When we don't have access to those things usually. Usually the dogmatic, philosophical ideas we have, we think are totally dis, distant from or unrelated to our personal childhood development and uh, ideas and our family life. And it's just not true. Actually, a lot of that is determined uh, in those ways and, and, and predisposes us to what one thing or another. Uh, I, I'll give some speculative answers to your question. Well, why didn't they embrace orthodoxy? Uh, I think, first and foremost, they didn't have much contact. Secondly, the contact they had uh, probably was very limited. They didn't know Greek. They didn't know, maybe Shuan did a little bit, but not any contact with contemporary orthodoxy and uh, athos. And, uh, so there's just a, a, a barrier there. Secondly, the, the contact they did have was through the lens of their Catholicism or their Protestantism, so their bias. Third, uh, they... They're men, you know, perennialists for all the spiritual life that I have to talk about. They're extreme rationalists. They're extremely committed to their intellect. And, of course, that's the problem uh, that they have, right? That they don't understand they need to crucify them to become truly and totally wise. Uh, and ultimately, they talk about that, but they don't actually get to the point of doing it because it can't happen outside of Christ. It can't happen to the degree it needs to happen unless we submit to Christ incarnate, right? So, so. To become orthodox, you have to, just like Paul says, I've died. Like Father Sarah says, I died to everything, right, to become Christian, to become orthodox. You've got to die. You've got to totally die. And so, um, you know, I, obviously I understand perennials. No, 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 that's all there. It's all within the tradition. No, that's on an intellectual level, in a real time and space we're talking about, the death of the old man. And that happens under spiritual guidance. It happens in the divine mysteries. And so those who are super, super intellectual are, are going to have a tough time embracing orthodoxy, just like the the uh, Pharisees and the intellectuals of the day had a tough time embracing uh, the religion of the 12 fishermen, right? So I think that's the basic answer, is that it's not going to be 
easy. It's not going to be fashionable. It's not going to be rewarding. It's not going to be intellectually satisfying. Uh, they think uh, ultimately it is, but on one level, it's not going to be uh, this. I mean, Newman, for instance, Cardinal Newman, uh, the little that I've read, what stuck out, struck, struck me when I was reading it back when I was in my PhD, this is the disdain he had for Orthodox and the way he talked about uh, Orthodoxy in Greece of his day. It was like, you know, these poor, pathetic, illiterate, you know, uh, uh, Serbian, Romanian, Greek uh, uh, villagers. You know, there was a disdain for the 12 fishermen, ultimately, right? And the orthodoxy was seen as this backward. I remember when, uh, uh, this is very much in the spirit of, of the contemporary intellectuals. That, why is it, why has Brunelism become so, so uh, you know, uh, trendy in the, uh, in the Berkeley, you know, and Yale uh, Department of Religion and University of Chicago and all this, uh, precisely for this reason, right? Because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's seen as like, you know, avant-garde and of this world, of this age. I mean, the the, the thing about Brennanism is that, that they think that they're they're you know they're part of this this tradition coming down to us, and they're not a part of the modern world. But Brennanism is very much a part of the modern world. It's a rebel a rebellion against the modern world from within the modern world, and as a and as a fruit of the modern world. As I said earlier on when we began this discussion, it is the fruit of the pendulum swinging. It is one it is it is one last attempt to answer. The, the extremes and to give a supposed royal path and a, and a via media which does not give them, ultimately does not give that but that's the that's the fake solution the demons want to give mankind we're going to give you what only christ can give we're going to give it out in this way so um uh, when my father and his parish 30 years ago 33 32 years ago uh, left anglicanism in, in north in the north bay in california embraced orthodoxy 150 people Famously, Bishop Swing at the time, or Spong, or whatever. No, Spong was another. Swing was his name, uh, who was the who was the inventor of the Parliament of Religions idea in San Francisco. I don't know if it ever materialized, but he was this. We have a Parliament of Religions, very much a part of this of this spirit of this age of perennialism and communism. He famously said in his article responding to my father and his whole parish becoming Orthodox, they have left for a backwater religion. Right? That's how these people view Orthodox. In their arrogance and in their in their trust in their own intellect and the you know luciferic pride, Orthodox is a backwater religion, you know? and that's I think the problem with the the perennialists. They can't humble themselves to become Orthodox, and if they do, they can't humble themselves to leave off their perennialist masters and trust the the fishermen. Many times, unfortunately, uh, I, I hope that that's not the case. I hope there are many perennialists who have Father Seraphim certainly seems to have left it all behind and crucified his intellect and, and never looked back. That's He's a great example for us. He was a perennialist, Father Seraphim Rose. He was committed to that. He was in that school. Uh, and, you know, uh, that was very fashionable in the Eastern Religious Studies Departments at Berkeley and uh, San Francisco. And he crucified his intellect and became Orthodox. Never looked back. Could you submit the following question for Q&A? This is to, from James. What do you think of the Baha faith to be the forerunner of the Antichrist? Is there a relationship of Baha to Pernod? Yes, very much of this uh, same uh, school of thought. I have not studied Baha, the, to tell the truth, but the little I know about it, the little I know about it, you know, it's Masonic uh, influenced, and the, the, of course, uh, Masonry has, uh, there, Masonry in the 1930s, 40s had a renewal in France, partly because it, not very influential, but a little influential was Canon in that. And so uh, perennialism was became fashionable among certain nations in Europe, not in America so much. But so it's it's not hard for a Masonic mind to embrace perennialism. It's, it's, it works. Um, and they're just not usually they're not very sophisticated, so they don't. But um, that's uh, and I think so. Baha'i is uh, definitely. Uh, but it's, it, I don't know. I, I don't know much about how to tell you. I don't, I don't know if it's, if it really identifies with all the tenets of Pranos. Probably not. Probably not. But I don't know. I don't know much more. But it is definitely of this, of this age, of the spirit of, of ecumenism. No, no doubt about it. Question one. I'm looking to become a catech, uh, become a catechumen. I think you mean at a local roll court church. However, the only liturgy I can attend is in Russian. I have a basic understanding of the language 
should I still attend this church or should I look for another one? This is the only World Court church in my area. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, uh, for your question. Uh, should you attend a church in which the main language is not English? Uh, you said you have uh, a basic understanding of the language. Well, that's certainly very good. Uh, look, um, in the hierarchy of things, uh, you know, language is pretty important and especially very important for the catechetical uh, stage. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, but the good news is you have access to all the catechetical materials. I'm assuming the priest speaks English. And, and so, um, and, and, and having said that, it's not just the extra liturgical materials that's important in English. It's the liturgy liter itself is, and, the, and all the divine services are catechetical. In other words, when we go to orthos or matins, we're being catechized. That's what a lot of it, a lot of that's about. It's not just a praise of God or worship of God. It's actually directed as much, if not more, to, to the body of Christ and the formation of the body of Christ. It was during the dark days of Turkocratia, the Turkish period, that the, the Orthodox people hung on to the Orthodoxy without access to higher education or a lot of books, or or they were they were being high, heavily influenced by Western, uh, uh, you know, ideas. They hang on, hang on to orthodoxy, hung on to orthodoxy through the services, through the liturgical books, through uh, the, the divine services and, and, and praying and, and listening. Uh, and many of them were illiterate people. They didn't know, uh, they, didn't, they didn't know ancient Greek very well. And yet they went deep and, they, and they, they carried on and they lived in a deep piety. So the answer is yes, stay there. The answer is it's the hierarchy of things is there's more fundamental and important than the language. If you found a parish where there is deep love, prayer, piety, uh, orthodoxy, uh, view matica, uh, uh, experiential uh, orthodoxy, then you can you you can remain and and the language, uh, especially if you say you have some access to the language, you have some knowledge. But I would say stay, um, especially since you say basically there's nothing else uh, to go to there. This is the only rural core area. Church in my area. So, um, yes, we need absolutely to do catechism in English. Yes, we need to have services in English. Yes, it's obvious. These things are obvious. We don't need to discuss this anymore. But the reality is, we will have and continue to have many local parishes and monasteries that are not using the English language. What do we do? It doesn't, doesn't mean we abandon the orthodoxy. It doesn't mean we can't go deep. We can. And so, if that's uh, your only option, that's what you should do. Then stick with it and go deep. Uh, that's what I would say. Your blessing, Father, could it be said that the perennialists confuse what God wills with what God permits? Um, I, that's a really good question um, in terms of can we examine how much among the perennialists, I have done this, have they understood the kat evdokian thelima to see, that is the, the will of God, and that is his good pleasure, that he wills. Right, pers you know, par excellence, he wills, right? He wills salvation, he wills the incarnation, all this. And that which got, is katapara hortisi in Greek, that which he allows. I, I would imagine that they've delved into this. I haven't read enough literature to see exactly what, you know, the various thinkers would have to say on that. But that would be very interesting to see if they've confused that. And that, that, that leads them to this idea that since, I mean, in particular about this question of, well, look at coming down to us. We have all these different cultures and, and languages and peculiarities among the peoples, and therefore God must, you know, basically bow to that, acquiesce to that, and therefore He, through the religions, works salvation. That seems that it could be a misunderstanding of His will with what He allows. I think there's some there could be a, a lack there, uh, but more fundamentally, I mean, did they never read Pentecost? Have they never understood the Christian understanding of the, of the overcoming of the Tower of Babel? Do they not see that actually Christ, I mean, it's irreconcilable. They want to include Christianity among the religions. And they want to reconcile it with religion. This is the most absurd aspect of Brazilism. I mean, it's irreconcilable. The universality, the Catholicity, rather, uh, in terms of truth, in terms of experience of truth in this world, in time and space. It's that is, In Christianity, the vision of that is totally irreconcilable with the idea uh, that is that is promoted in perennialism with regard to religions, and that Pentecost teaches us that in clearly that all the religion, all the languages, and all the peoples of the world are meant to receive the gospel. 
and the gospel has to be preached to all the people of the earth. There's no sense in Christianity that we're going to limit ourselves. Or we are limiting ourselves, and this is God's will that we not limit ourselves to a portion of humanity, a segment or sector of humanity. That is, a, that is so contrary to the words of our Lord, to the life of the church, to the mission of the church for 2,000 years. So how anyone, in my mind, how anyone could be a perennialist and an Orthodox Christian and not see that, that this is irreconcilable, it, blo it boggles the mind. And the only way that I think that that can happen is that they're perennialists that are Orthodox and not Orthodox who follow uh, or embrace perennialism. See, that the hierarchy, the order of things is, is, is still first perennialism, second Orthodoxy. Otherwise, it's, I don't see how you could do it. I mean, just on the face, it's not hard to see. Uh, I'm sure they will say, Father Peter, you're so simplistic. Uh, Father Peter, you don't understand. You don't have the intellectual power to go deeper and see that the, all these things are united on the esoteric level. Esoteric level. Yeah, okay. The, the, that's, that's their insane Luciferic pride that they think that they have that, uh, you know, Gnostic knowledge. It's very interesting that he, he started out in Gnosticism, right? And then he went to Masonry. And he never really, I'm talking about getting on. Did he ever really cease to be a Gnostic? That's the question. I don't think so. I mean, that uh, perennialism is very, and, and Shuan is very, reminds very much of Gnosticism in the ancient church. Is tra self transcendence an aspect of theosis? Not in the perennialist or Eastern religious for, for the vision of, of things. Self transcendence, you have to unpack that. What do you mean, self transcendence? Certainly, on one level, we can talk about that. But not in the, I don't think in the Eastern, in the Eastern, in other words, Far Eastern version of that. Uh, you say, I'm having difficulty understanding the sense of self in relation to our faith, Bradley. Um, the human person is in Christ totally and utterly valued and renewed and cleansed and purified and illumined and deified and so the deep self the true self uh is not transcended at all in the sense of left behind abandoned um you know uh let's say you know put off that flesh no no that's that's clearly not what's happening what's happening is that that which is contrary to nature that which is Contrary to, to the true person, the inner man is put off. And that's what's meant with the, derog the derogative sense of flesh, obviously, and the passions, right? Uh, so what we often identify as ourself, as we see today with homosexuality, I am a homosexual people, I am a homosexual, identify as trans, I'm a man, whatever. This is exactly what does not happen here. We do not identify with sin as being ourselves, right? That is, it is a parasite, right? So not, it's, that's not, that is not, right? That's what we're putting off. That's what we're transcending. What we identify, what mankind defends today is myself. Who am I? I am a, you know, uh, whatever, fill in the blank. And usually it's sinfulness and, and distortions and perversions and, uh, or even just worldliness. I am this and I identify as something in the world, something corrupted or something created alone. No, we are, identity is Christ. In the ancient church, they didn't say, I am Peter Hears. They said, I am a Christian when they were getting martyred. They're identified, they're, they identified entirely and totally with the person of Christ. They united themselves with Christ. He is their identity, right? So that's, that's the, the redeemed, the resurrected human being in Christ. That's who we are. And that is not transcended. That's totally imminent in man. And that's embraced. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's one answer. Uh, when you knew James Cutsinger, did he ever give an account for how he reconciled being Orthodox while still holding to perennialism? Um, no, he just tried to defend perennialism. I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I didn't have, you know, zillions of discussions with him. I was a young man in my 20s, I think 25, maybe. Well, it was, yeah, 25 when I was down there, 24. Uh, and then I saw him again a number of times throughout, uh, you know, my my life since then he, here in Arizona when he was visiting the monastery on a couple of occasions and up in uh, uh, the monastery in, in St. Paisios. 
uh, in uh, northern in north of here, and we had discussions about these theological topics. So I, I never got into you know full fledged how do I reconcile the two. Uh, my concern was to show him that it's irreconcilable, and so most of our discussion was about these points of ecclesiology and soteriology and, and things we discussed, some of the things we discussed tonight. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know his defense uh, beyond, uh, you know, what I said tonight, which was what he said to me was, look, the logos, just like logos firmaticos, right, the logos that we see working in the Old Testament and, and seeding in the religions of the world, uh, the proto evangelio that we see right in right there at the fall, right, the first gospel that was that was preached that there there will come, you know, will bruise your head, right, and then all, all throughout. I've given two talks on this. You can go on orthodoxethos.com and look at um, the expectation of the nations. It's called two talks on in among the nations, not just among the prophets, but among the nations. They were waiting for Christ. All right, so those those seeds were planted by our Lord, the logos, right. So that. Logos, he says, is the logos at work in all the religions, and so he tries to he tries to tell us now, post incarnation, that that's how we can reconcile the religions and perennialism with Christianity. But as I said tonight, that's not possible. The minute we have logos, sarx, et yeneto, and the minute he ascends with our flesh to the right hand of the Father, and the minute we say that he will return with his flesh and the Marks of the nails will be apparent, and they are apparent in the iconography. That no longer is applicable. This idea that the first of all, all of that was preliminary, it was not fulfilled. This is not the perennialist vision. The perennialist vision does not stop there, it does not limit itself to foreshadowing, planting seeds, right? So, this is clearly not reconcilable with the Orthodox. Christology, what he's talking about, but that's how he tried to reconcile. He tried to try to try, try to create a bridge and on the basis of the logos and the theology of the logos. That's all I can tell you. All right. I'm simple. Can you simplify? <laughs> no, actually, I can't. Uh, that's not possible because perennialism is not that simple. Right? I did my best. I gave some images. I gave some explanations, but I can't. I did just go back and, and, and look again. Uh, uh, and hopefully some of the imagery and some of the descriptions will help you understand what's at stake. But um, sorry, I'm not I'm not that spiritual, unfortunately. If I was super spiritual, I could give you really simple explanations, but I'm not. When Christ returns, won't all things be resurrected? Indeed, all not things, but all people will be resurrected. If so, if any other so-called Christ comes, even if he does miracles with no resurrection following, Will that be the lie detector test? Well, by the time the resurrection happens, everything is done. There's a new heaven and new earth. So the deception is going to come before the appearance of Christ at his second coming. How can we protect ourselves from deception? Um, I said at one point during this talk, if you want to avoid the deception that's coming, I said it twice, and I repeated it, and I said, you've got to pay attention to this point right here. Um, and I'm trying to go back and find that for you. Um, but you might, have to, you might have to go back and rewind. Um, but the key here uh, to remember is that the temptation that's coming upon the whole earth with the, uh, the Antichrist is the rejection and doubt of the theanthropic person of Jesus Christ and his body. And so when they say, don't deny Christ, but accept all the religions as equal paths up the mountain, otherwise you're a bigot. There you go. You've got their calling card, right? They're, they have arrived, and now it is up to us to... to to resist. If we go along with that lie, we are denying Christ, even if we don't deny Christ, right? Formally. Because that is the perennialist vision. That is the humanist vision. That is the lie of the Antichrist. And Christ now becomes Christ incarnate, which the body of Christ now become one of many paths up the mountain, one of many religions, 
and not revelation, not no longer the uh, uh, unique salvation of the world. And of course, that's that's a denial of Christ and 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 the and a likening of the uncreated with the created, a likening of Christ with the demons, a likening of the religions, which it says in the Psalms, all the gods of the religions are demons. Now we're taking, we're saying Christ's body, not his religion, there is no religion, there's a body, and there's revelation, is like unto the demons, right? So the implications are grave. And so I would say that is, when you see that, you know we're standing before the gravest temptation. That is the great lie. Father, can you elaborate on logos primaticos in the context of perennialism? I just did. I just talked about that. Um, I believe Dr. Kutzinger called it upon it when explaining perennialism in his lectures. What is the Orthodox faith? I just did that. So I think I answered your question. If I did not answer your question, maybe you can be more specific. Uh, DM. Uh, but I think I just just talked about that. Somebody asked me what was his point. I explained what I thought his understanding was. I it's been years since I heard it. We probably should have sought it out and looked at it and then answered it directly. Maybe we can do that in a follow up. Um, but that's what I understand. And maybe there's some really interesting discussion there. I don't know. Um, but I think I answered that. Christina Kitt, thank you, Father. You bet. The most challenging part is to awaken our beloved ones. Is there a way to do that? Many of us have atheists in our families or people who say they believe, but they are asleep. Thank you for your question. So how does one awaken from slumber? Um, there are many pedagogical tools that Christ uses. The most effective and least painful is the presence of holiness in one's life. So many awoke from sleep when they met a saint like Elder Ephraim. Thousands, hundreds if not thousands of people awoke from sleep simply by sitting in the presence of a glorified, deified human being. And they came to themselves and then they came to Christ in that order. And, uh, or together actually, because those are simultaneous. So that's, that's the presence of holiness. How can they come into the presence of holiness? That's the key, number one. Number two, because many have become so insensitized to holiness or because they're far from it, many times the Lord allows for tragedy, allows for great challenge in order to bring about humility. And because pride is death to the soul and humility is life, God allows pedagogically for people to be humbled exceedingly. And so that is another possibility. And that's something you cannot obviously provoke and predict, but you can certainly pray for and be prepared for. Um, so those are the two basic like wings of this, of this dove that is uh, to be awoken from sleep. Uh, and you might say, well, okay, fine. I don't know of any saints and uh, uh, tragedy hasn't struck. So what do we do? Well, uh, there is no other option but for you to become a saint and I to become a saint and, and to go deeper. So our repentance, our deepening is the best possible medicine for those around us. Not our pharisaical preaching, not our uh, blind uh, uh, pressuring, which doesn't recognize the nature of what repentance is, right? It doesn't bring it doesn't bring about a repentance. It brings about uh, uh, usually uh, anger and rejection. Uh, and when it, there is success in in such a tech, such a methodology, it's it's because um, the person was already disposed. And in spite of our pride and arrogance and pressure, uh, he comes or she comes to Christ. So never uh, is something good done in a bad way. All right, so the good of someone coming to Christ is not going to be, it's not going to come about because of our bad experience, our bad witness, our bad uh, and 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 worldly and proud uh, words. And so there is no, there is no, uh, unlike sin, which is easy to fall into, virtue is hard to come by. There is no quick McDonald's version uh, that I can tell you. Right? Okay, drive up 
an order version, which is what people uh, uh, in America always want their spirituality to be about. That's what they're used to, right? So there is no, there's nothing. Uh, it is either we're drawn or we're, or, or we're, or brought down and then raised up again. That's how things uh, work spiritually. So monasteries, divine liturgy, everywhere there's holiness, that they need to come into contact with holiness. And and when when challenge comes, they need to, through your through your example and prayer, face it and, and come to self-knowledge. Those are the two ways I think mainly people come to Christ. Is there a book or source that I can use to learn about the overall history of Orthodox Christianity, Jason's world? Uh, a book or source? Um, there's many books. Uh, there's many introductory books. You can find them online on Amazon uh, about the Orthodox Church, about faith and life. I like the one by uh, Elder Gregory of Mount Athos, The Life and Faith of the Orthodox Church. Uh, I don't know. It's up to you. You're, everybody's different. Everybody has kind of like a, a, an angle that they're looking at. Like some are very intellectual. Some are very interested in music and art. And So uh, I think you need to search out and pray fervently to God and, and then search out for those which you are drawn to. And uh, uh, there are many ways people come to Christ in the church. Um, so, uh, you know, I can't really say, well, this is it. Everyone must read this book. It's a must read. Well, there are many must reads because they're all talking about Christ and the church and they're, they're, they're good about it. So I don't know what to tell you in terms of uh, overall history. Um, you know, the Orthodox Church by Calista Square used to be kind of the classic. Uh, it's a pretty, it's a short version of that. There are several volume versions of history of the church uh, from different writers. Yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't anything like, you must read this. Sarah, Independent Baptist here. Welcome, Sarah. Good to have you with us. I've been learning about Orthodoxy, and I was thinking of going to an Orthodox church this Sunday. Should I wear a head cover? Sarah, I don't know where you're going to go and what they're going to expect and what, you know, many churches, women do wear head coverings, and it's a blessed thing. It's certainly a traditional blessed thing to do. Absolutely. And if you go to a more traditional-minded parish where people are cognizant of that, then the women will be wearing head coverings. Monasteries, all the women wear head coverings. And many of the Rokor parishes, because of their tradition coming from the monasteries that were heavily influential in the Russian presence in America, they're wearing head coverings. Other places, uh, other churches, they don't have that. Uh, but it's not that that is reflective of the Orthodox tradition. The Orthodox tradition has women wearing head coverings, has for 2,000 years. Uh, up until very recently, it was universal in the Orthodox Church. So um, it's a good thing. If you wear it, I think it's a good thing. I don't know where you're going to be. I don't know where you're going to be going. I'll tell you, if you go to a parish where they're not doing that uh, so often, uh, they'll think you are Orthodox in a heartbeat because it's, it's uh, it'll be a sign of your uh, of your seriousness. And so, um, you know, it's blessed. It's a blessed thing. Should you do a blessed thing, do it. Do it and pray to God and you're going to work out. And pray. Uh, pray a lot. Going and, and while you're there, ask God to enlighten you and ask God to guide you. Ask God to show you his truth, his His body, his grace, right? Uh, that's the most important thing. More than any other thoughts or books or right prayer to God to show you. Father, what would you say for those who are creative-minded and compulsively self-expressive but interested in orthodoxy? How does the church view creativity and imagination to individuals? Not at all. But you've got to funnel that creativity in obedience. Like it's got to be purified in the fire of humility and obedience. Purified. You want that creativity. You want that that uh, self-expression to be not simply a human passionate expression, but a divine human expression. You want it to be purified in the fire of purification, illumination, purification of the church's ascetic struggle of obedience right so that's it's not denial of that we do not deny that who we are god who god made us uh, i mean we have iconography we have sacred chant we have all kinds of things that are very much uh expressions of human uh ingenuity and beauty and creativity and yet it's not according to their own will it's not this modern art insanity but it's within the confines and the boundaries of sacred art, of sacred chant, of sacred uh, uh, art generally, right? So uh, I think that's the key. So you've got to be willing to crucify everybody. 
as to be willing to be crucified and crucify their intellect and accept and mold, and be molded and fashioned anew, uh, first in the baptismal font and then in the ascetic struggle uh, over time. Uh, but that does not kill creativity, far from it. it. does not kill individual expression even. I mean, there are iconographers, they're very different from one from another, and yet they're all striving within the boundaries laid down by the Holy Fathers in terms of uh, sacred art. So there you go. I don't know what kind of art or what kind of expression you, you have, but that's a general rule, I think, applicable. Obviously, Bradley says we're all beings, but what is the self? Is even Christian as a concept? Or are we simply spirits and flesh? So we are body and soul. We're not simply spirits in flesh, as if these two things are separate. Our, we will be raised on the last day. The body will be raised. And we are not fully human without the body. And the self is, I think that we point to the image and likeness, right? That's what we do in Orthodox theology. We talk about the image and likeness of God. We were created in the image and the likeness. We, we lost the likeness when we sinned, and the image was obscured. In baptism, it is renewed. It is cleansed. It is, once again, shining forth the image. And the process of, once again, becoming like God, which was given to Adam and now in Christ, is given to us. Uh, that is a lifelong and eternal process, and it demands our synergy, our cooperation. But in the the aftoxusio in Greek, that is the self authority, maybe or self power. I'm not really sure. Aftoxusio. It's hard to translate. That's where you're going to find uh, the most, especially the image of God in us. Uh, freedom, in other words. That God gave to us, being made in His own image, and that—that uh, that is, uh, I think, where we point to the self. And um, so, I'm not really sure what else you're getting at. That's the uniqueness. Each one of us is made in His image, but we're unique. I think that's pointing to the self. I don't know. I I, I can't get into deep theological. I'm not capable, but I'm also not time wise. I'm not able to do that. All right. So we have. Father, here's hello. Have you checked Kutzinger's Christological statements in the two natures of Christ? It is very close to Nestorius position and it's very aligned to Shuan's position too. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, that's not surprising at all. Not surprising at all. And I have not. Um, I've not. Frankly, as I was saying to somebody today, and I'm sure the perennialists who are uh, listening or those who are Orthodox who want to defend perennialism will criticize me for this, but I've never been that taken by perennialism to sit at the feet of them and want to learn from them. It's never happened. I've The things I talked about tonight, I think, are sufficient to say this is not worth our time. Um, now, you know, if I want to give a full, full, ref, ref, uh, you know, rebuttal, then I should take the time and, and get to know all the, all the ins and outs. But I never had that desire, never felt it necessary. And I've always been astounded by those who think that this is something that the church should, you know, we should sit at the feet and, and become students of, of these thinkers. I don't, I don't feel it at all. Uh, it, it just does not ring true. So, but that's very interesting. Thank you for letting me know about that. And I, and I, it would be good uh, to read that and, and, you know, become, but I, I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's all that necessary, but okay. I mean, that would be good. Is there salvation outside the Orthodox church and why? This is Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. So Daniel, I've had this question many times. This is a very popular question, and usually it's answered within the paradigms that are presented uh, in, wrongly, a misunderstanding, somebody like St. Cyprian in the West, wrongly presented in the medieval papal Protestant West or Protestant contemporary or the contemporary, you know, syncretistic environment. And it's kind of like almost a trick question. I, I'm not saying you're asking a trick question, but this is this is it's so wrought with problems because people in the Protestant world are associating um the boundary of the church identity of the church uh, um as as absolutely identified with the boundaries and identity of salvation and that's and in one in some ways that's true uh 
and so we need to unpack we need to unpack things well and it's wrongly understood within process in my experience so first and foremost to answer the question we have to answer what is salvation so what is salvation because if you answer a Protestant version of salvation you've got totally or the, what is salvation right salvation is being in communion with God communion right being restored to the image and come into the likeness and it happens in communion and that communion happens in of course the mysteries and through the mysteries christ is he that is given and gives in every mystery and so christ and his body and his mysteries are totally inseparable and one and therefore if i want to be saved in other words saved from what death sin and death right what is death? separation Eternally, the, the death that it talks about is talked about in the book of Revelation, it's not just the separation of the soul from the body, but more importantly, the separation from God. That is death. So, communion, unity in Christ is salvation. It's the opposite of death and separate and sin, which separates us. Sin is a missing of the mark, right? So now with the mark, communion. So sin is not being in communion, not being in communion, the one is in communion and, and has the mind, it's going to have the mind of Christ, it's going to have the will of God, right? So salvation clearly is given through and in Christ, which means through and in the church. Famously, I think Father Filarski did a great service to us when he said, what St. Cyprian said is a tautology. In other words, it's simply restating the same thing. He said there is no salvation outside the church. He, he's, re, he's redundant. Salvation is the church. Right? That's that's what has been given to us. That's what has been revealed to us. That is what has been taught to us. There's no debate here. It's obvious that this is the case. And of course, the Orthodox Church is the body of Christ. So, end of discussion. Well, almost. In our day and age, we want what about this? What about that? What if? Right? We want the we want the exception. And most of the time we want the exception because we want it for some personal reason like i have a brother sister mother father i'm committed to something on a personal level that i i don't want to come to any conclusion that would be you know devastating all right so that's perfectly understandable but unfortunately we're driven by those things which which i think um can obscure our vision so uh the the one last thing you would add to that explanation would be some examples of the economy of salvation that is uh, not the exactitude and the crivia that I just said. In other words, not been the economy of salvation has been handed down. I just described the economy of salvation, Christ throughout the ages, the continuation of the incarnation, the church, and participation in his divine energies in the church. What about those who never heard of the church? What about those who never heard of Christ? What about the thief on the cross? Like he didn't. He wasn't baptized. He was maybe. Well, people say he was baptized in his blood. Well, not really, because he was a sinful man and he was getting what came to him. But in any case, he was in paradise with Christ. So what is that? That's the economy of salvation, also. But it's it's can be understood as a like a detour that ends up again on the main road, so to speak. It's a it's it's the truth of the, the following in action, that God is not under his own commandments. He's not beholden or limited by his own commandments. Pretty obvious, right? God gives the commandments. God gives us the commandments, which are absolute for us. He says, this is how you're going to be saved, baptized. This is how you're going to be, you know, go throughout the world preaching baptism. Whoever does not accept it is damned. I mean, it's very clear. The Lord says, and yet, and yet he himself is not bound by it. And so he can do whatever he likes and he does whatever he likes. And so the ultimate answer is, is there salvation outside the church? Well, there's no salvation outside the church because the church is Christ and there's no salvation outside of Christ. But can God and Christ do whatever he likes outside of the revealed economy of salvation and the mystery of the theanthropic body of Christ? Yes, he certainly can. It's not been revealed to us what and how he's going to do it, but he certainly can. And that's as far as we go. So you want to be saved, you come to Christ. And coming to Christ means coming to the church. Everything else, in a ectu ponyru, as it says, is from the enemy, right? Yes, my yes is yes and no and no. All the rest is from the enemy, right? That's what we need to avoid. We're coming here, we're asking, 
It's like it's like the the lawyer coming at trick trick questions of Christ. I'm not saying you're doing this, Daniel. I'm saying people do this. We got to avoid it, right? Oh, oh, you know. And he says, "Why are you calling me good? There's only one who's good." Because look, you're not asking this question. You're coming. You're trying to get an answer out of me, right? That's what a lot of people are doing with this question. It's clear what he wants. Become a disciple. Be baptized. Crucify your intellect. Become a disciple. Be obedient. That's how you're saved. Is Freemasonry the same as Parentism? No. No, it's not. And in, the, in particular, Parentism we're talking about is the Genon, Shuan, Burkhart, you know, school of thought, right? Houston Smith. It's a particular school, traditional school. Freemasonry is Freemasonry. It's two different things, but they're not the same. Are there many Freemasons that, that talk like perennialists? Absolutely. But they're grosser versions of perennialism, usually, and they're more universalist in a more like theo theosophical way, right? Um, the universalism, that's where he started. Genel started it in that new little, and then he refined it and he went to the East and all the rest, as we know. But that he's he never really threw off ultimately the universalism in my in our from our perspective as Orthodox. I don't think he ultimately threw it off. He gave his own version of it, and some say he didn't even really embrace it. He was a he was a Sufi who didn't embrace it ultimately. But in any case, Shuan definitely did, and he had his version, and that's what's really come down to us. I think Shuan is more impactive than Ginon in terms of the question of the religions and 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 the limits and all the things we're going to talk about tonight. Shuan is really the the main thinker. What do we make of Romans 2? Can this be interpreted in a perennialist way? Romans 2. Well, let's put it on the screen here. Romans 2. I mean, it's a whole chapter. You got to be a little more specific. What do you want uh, to say about Romans 2? There's, a, there's, there's 29 verses. What, what's your question? Uh, if you want to ask the question i'll come back to it but i'm not going to try to figure out try to try to imagine what you're what you're getting at so uh, we'll come back to that when will uh when will you visit jordanville again uh whenever god arranges it uh, i'm invited uh, i have many beloved wonderful people up there and it would be good to be back but i don't have any visit uh, anything on the agenda right now it would be great to come back i was there when was it there last Summertime? I can't remember. Father, is it wrong to tell people who believe in the rapture theory that it is not true? Uh, no. It's good to tell them it's not true. But how you do that, in what time and place, is a question of discernment. And I can't answer that because I don't know who you're talking about and what the context is. But is it generally good to tell people that it is, it is delusional? Yeah. Prepare yourself. Be ready. Don't go and just say it. Be ready and and say it in a humble, meek way. Hey, I'd like to share this with you. You might want to consider the Orthodox view of this. Orthodox Church, 2,000 years, never embraced this idea. It's very recent. Uh, I love you. That's what I'm I mean, whatever. I know you find a way to do it in a loving, pastoral way. I think that's important. Jason's World Gifted One Orthodox Ethos membership. Thank you very much, Jason. God bless you if that's your name, Jason. And the Orthodox Ethos Gifted Five Orthodox Ethos membership. Thank you very much, Orthodox Ethos. And Puro Mateo. I'm a creator of the Orthodox who recently came back to the church humbly and with a heavy heart. What happened to Gohanch? Humanism and laxity is the norm. Well, um, you know, I, I never I never was a part of Gohanch. Uh, I, I went from the uh, Rokor OCA parishes on the West Coast, flew to Greece, went to Mount Athos, came back to came back, uh, was again in the OCA in the uh, OCA monastery for a bit. And, so I never really lived the GOA experience, and uh, never, never, never was in their diocese really. So I, I spent twenty years in Greece, and then when I came back from Greece, I taught at the Rokor, uh, you know, seminary. So I don't, I can't speak as one of Goars to tell you what happened. Um, I can just speculate from outside, and I would say that you know what's happening all around the world is happening to Goars, and that is the. Sickness of secularization, which is the spirit of Antichrist. It's the putting the church, uh, looking at it as a part of the world, uh, making it into the world uh, on all the different levels. That's the sickness that's everywhere. It's not just in Go Arch, it's all over the place. 
Uh, but that would be the way you would describe that. Now, the glory to God, uh, glory to God, it was, I think, uh, worse 30 years ago before Elder Fem and the monasteries were founded and people have been going to the monasteries for decades and a lot of young people coming to the monasteries, a lot of young zealot, zealous men who are, who are thinking about or going to seminary who are connected to the monasteries. And there's a real, uh, but like unseen uh, renewal slash re regeneration going on among a lot of young Greek men in the Orthodox Church who are in the Greek Archdiocese. So, um, you know, that's what I would suggest to you if you're coming back and you're wondering what's going on here, uh, go to a monastery, talk to the elders and fathers and sisters or whatever, and, uh, and uh, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see, uh, and you'll be assisted greatly. And there are many wonderful priests and pious priests in the Greek Archdiocese, but there is notably a gross secularization in many places, and it's very tragic. Uh, the leadership going back decades from the founder of the Greek Archdiocese, who was a Mason and a total ecumenist and a, one of the greatest heretics in the history of the church, Miletus Metexakis, introduced, in, introduced all kinds of innovation. And uh, of course, as a Mason, uh, you know, pretty well well recognized, uh, even in the Orthodox Church as a Mason, you know, a great grave heresy, grave delusion. He was the founder of the Greek Archdiocese. Uh, Athenagoras, also a grave, uh, gravely deluded and heretical teacher, Mason, uh, and, and introduced so many innovations and, and heretical ideas about Catholicism. He was a major influence, think, regards to Isaac. So, so that didn't help. <laughs> there, was, there have been pious uh, bishops and priests uh, throughout the, uh, the, the 100 years, 100 plus years of the regards to Isaac. Archbishop Michael, back in the 50s, was a pious man, uh, and, and many others. So, uh, you know, I... I tend to not think about the church in jurisdictional terms. We're all one body of Christ. All of them are just organizational divisions. There's one church. Christ is given and gives in every mystery in every parish. And we're all united in Christ. And so, um, you know, it's parts of the one body and in some places uh, are more effective than others, but uh, we're all together. In contemplation, can you find God everywhere? It's taught by Thomas Merton, Alan Watts in Behold the Spirit. So that is a very uh, kind of Gnostic way of looking at things. We don't talk about that. Like, can you be, you are not your brain. You are not a theoretical, a theory. You're not a thought. You're your body and soul. How do you find God? In time and space, that's where you are. You're in time and space, and you find God in time and space. And thank God, He came into time and space, and He dwelt, and He dwells, and He's present in time and space. And you commune with Him, and you unite yourself to Him, not just in thought, but in word and deed, in body and soul. And He became flesh, and He offered His flesh to you. Because that's the only way you could truly have communion with him is in the flesh. In the flesh that you walk in and, and is part of you, the body that is and in his body and his blood. So you find God and know God as incarnate in the body, in the body of Christ, in the church, in the flesh. That's how you're going to come to know him. That's how, that's, that's how he is. You, we shall see him as he is. We have experienced of him in the body of Christ as he is. That is Christ incarnate, the logos, it starts again, as I said. So this idea that we're going to find him contemplating him uh, is problematic, I think. I mean, can you see him in creation? Absolutely. Can you see him in, in, in the image of God in your fellow man? Absolutely. Is that what you mean? Can you see him? Can you see his signs of his presence? Can you see... Yes, but that's not yet communion with him as he desires to us to have total communion with him. You can see his handiwork. You can see his, his presence. You can see him in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, in, in many ways, but that's not enough. Just to acknowledge him. The demons acknowledge him. The demons see and acknowledge that he is God. He is Lord. They're not saved. They're not in communion. It's not enough. I love my priests and my parents dearly, and I'm not blaming them at all. 
or him, thank you for keeping me honest to tradition and the canons because it's so easy to just go with the changes. All right. Okay, Piero Matteo. Um, don't have to be angry with anybody. You don't have to blame anybody. You shouldn't. Um, this, you know, it's just just go deeper and look look to Christ. All right, there it is. Romans 2, 14 to 17. Let's look it up. 14 to 17. For when the Gentiles which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are law unto themselves, which show that the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, and also bearing witness, and their thoughts that mean while accusing or excusing, or else ex excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called a Jew, and the rest is in the law, and thou makest thy boast of God. All right, so we're talking about the famous teaching of the apostle concerning the Gentiles, which have not the law, talking about those who are outside of the economy of salvation in the Old Testament, but they do by nature the things that are contained in the law. These, having not the law, are law unto themselves. Okay, pretty, pretty straightforward. But now we're in the time of the incarnation. We're in the time of the revelation of the fullness of God. Right? So taking that and running with that and applying that across the board is a little problematic, it seems to me. We now, the minute you know that that fulfillment of the law is now incarnate, you're going to run to that. You're going to embrace that, and that's going to be your salvation. And he goes on, the apostles goes on, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts. So the work of the law, the fulfillment of the law is the spirit. So that's what changed with the incarnation, is Pentecost came. And we commune with him in the spirit. It's God himself. And it's not simply keeping the law. So I don't know how you, this can become now a, like a su supplant. The fullness of the gospel and simply and, and suffice for an answer for salvation of the world. I don't see how I think it's not sufficient. Uh, we are simply going to see here that the Lord has his criteria as it says God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. All right, so God shall judge. Absolutely. And he'll judge the hearts. And those who never heard the gospel, never understood, they will be judged according to the, the words of the apostle. But salvation has been revealed. Salvation has been given. Salvation is Christ. And Christ is known in the, in the mysteries and the mysteries of the church. So if you want salvation, you run to the church. That's all. Everything else, again, as I said earlier, all the rest I feel is an attempt to be a little like the lawyer, you know, as opposed to come in like the apostles or the repentant, you know, woman with the issue of blood or the Samaritan woman or whatever. These are the examples we have. That's the ones we should imitate. And that's what we should be concerned about. God bless Father. Uh, thank you. Do people visit prophetic monks to help guide them in the personal life or do prophetic monks only give prophecies regarding the church? Absolutely. All these great saints and elders and monks that we know in the 20th century. Elder uh, Paisios, Elder Perfidios, Elder Jacobos, Elder Cleopa, Elder Gabriel, Elder Ephraim. What were they? They were constantly interacting with the people of God, teaching, confessing, guiding them. Their life was bound up with their salvation. Run to the monasteries. In the end times, they will be the places of salvation that will be keeping the faith. That's very clear. Can we argue that we need God and God does not need us? Well, that's certainly true. I mean, he's not in need of anything, right? Not just us. But what do you mean by need? Right? Absolutely we need God. But does he not need us? What do you mean need? That's the question. And do we have the free choice and will and choice to have a relationship with him or not? Yes, absolutely, of course. Everything he does is for us. We have need of everything. He is, there's no necessity upon God, if that's what you mean. I'm not sure what you're. He loves us. I mean, in that sense, he, 
in a way you could say he needs us because he loves us, but not in the sense of some kind of necessity upon him. Uh, we see the ancestors of Adam always have, he died. We see the ancestors of Adam always have, he died at the end. When you, when you to the genealogy of Christ, it, this is not well written, folks, I can't understand. To the genealogy of Christ, it doesn't say he died. So how do we determine what happened to Adam, Eve, after death? I'm um, not really sure what you're asking. Forgive me. This is um, needs to be corrected and edited and rewritten. Um, how do we determine what happened to Adam? Well, we know they were in Hades and they embraced Christ and he brought them out of Hades. So I'm not really sure what the question is. Yeah. All right, one more question. We are going on two hours and 30 minutes. We do have more time for questions. We have some questions over in Crowdcast, which I'll go to next, and then we'll come back. So I'm not a prayer list, but I love social political commentaries of Evola and Genon. That's fine. Okay, no worries. There's a lot of good stuff they've written, but uh, it's got to be taken with a grain of salt. Father, are you able to comment on St. Uh, Gavrila? Papayani, in light of the statement from the Metropolitan Perez Office of Heritage and Sex, thank you, Father. I think we've already done this, like, uh, back in the day when this all hit. It's kind of not on the agenda tonight, so I'm not sure. And it's very general what you're asking. What do you want exactly me to comment on? I already answered this in previous live streams. I'll just say the following, that <clears throat> in her life, which I've read many years ago, and there's been many criticisms about the book right, and how it's written, what's written there. There are very serious problems in her life. The way it's been written and, pre and presented to us. Is it all accurate? I don't know. Did she say everything that's written in there? I don't know. The things that are written there, some of them are very problematic. She was, in her early days, drinking from the well of a spirituality and 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 say and texts which were not orthodox she was very heavily influenced by if i remember correctly the imitation of christ by thomas the Kempis, which was not unlike not not that rare in those days in greece because of uh, a lot of westernization latinization and that influenced her and she went in india and she did things in india that are beyond the pale now having said all that and why that why they're right in their criticism. Is it possible that at the end of her life, when she returned to Greece and she lived in a monastery or started a monastery in one of the islands, that she actually made great progress in spiritual life and maybe even repented of some of the things that she really said and therefore really is truly glorified and was and, and is with the saints? Yes. And I think that that's why somebody like Mitch Paulton in the office of Morphe said she can definitely be with the saints and there's not, nothing wrong with it. None of that implies or should imply that the errors of her earlier life and the ideas presented in the book are orthodox. So it's one of these cases that we reject those things which are inconsistent with orthodoxy. We embrace the person like we do with Blessed Augustine. He has teachings that are clearly not consistent with patristic teaching, that are innovations or speculation and things like that. And we didn't adopt them. We have never adopted those views, some of those views, right? So we embrace the person. We reject some of the errors. Same with this this particular nun coming from Greece. Uh, but my concern is that those errors will be adopted and promoted by those in the church today who are ecumenists and are looking for a saint to support their ecumenism. And that's why it's problematic. It, that's, that's what's possibly problematic, is they're going to run with that, and they're going to point to these early times of her life and say, look, she did X, Y, Z, therefore this is a blessed thing to do. And that's it's easily refutable because it's not consistent with all the saints and all the tradition. And so that's not, it's not for our imitation. Um, and I think that's where the criticism comes and it's, it's, it's a necessary corrective. And I think you can have both. You can walk that royal path and say, accepted uh, in heaven, maybe glorified. Yes, okay, the church says she's glorified. And yet these errors are not, not consistent and they need to be rejected and they're not in pro and not for imitation. Okay, that's how I think I've answered it kind of multiple times. That's how I would answer that. 
Father, forgive me for this. Please forgive me because it's not directly related to the topic. Can you get your blessing to translate the book on the reception of heterodox into French? Oh, yeah, we talked about this, Daniel. I think I responded to you. Uh, maybe you didn't see my response. Uh, so there is hope in Paris for a rebirth of the dogmatic patristic cons consciousness and conscience on this all important matter for the health of our beloved mother, the church and for newcomers. I've tried. Yes, I've responded to you. Uh, I thought I did. And we are, uh, definitely working on translation of the book into multiple languages, including French. Uh, we have good news that it's begun in Russian. Uh, I need to actually get back to that. I'm glad you reminded me. Um, it's begun in Russian. And I hope it has. It's been a while since I talked to them. And then I think in Romanian, in Greek, uh, it's, but it's stalled in Greek. So anyway, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, Silouan, soon to be Silouan. God bless you and may be blessed to your baptism. Have you seen Father Seraphim's commentary on Rene? Yes, I have. And it's not very extensive. It's in his life. And, uh, and he points out the limitations of perennialism in the life, I think it's like page 600 or something in the large thousand page life. Yeah, I don't, I don't have it here, but. Father Peter, is it true that the Antichrist will be a Jew? Is this an established view in our tradition or is this just Theologumena? I've say, stated many times in our lectures on the book of Revelation uh, that the tradition coming down to us, the interpretation of the fathers, including St. Andrew of Caesarea and Elder uh, Athanasius is that indeed he will be from the tribe of, of Dan. And there's reasons why they say that, and there's reasons in the Old Testament, and the prophecies are based on that. You can look at it, uh, the relevant passions, a, a, a passage in Revelation where we comment on this in, the, in our long uh, 65 or 70 now uh, sessions on the book of Revelation, and why the fathers believe that he will be from the tribe. Yeah. Now, will he be, therefore, a leader of the Jewish people today? Will he be, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think that necessarily follows. But it's also said that he will definitely be favored by the Jews of the day, of the, in the time of Antichrist, that he will rebuild the temple for them, and he'll be hailed as the Messiah for them. So that's pretty standard. Uh, there will also be many Jews who will embrace Christ, as we know in the scriptures. They will come back. And there will be a remnant that will base, embrace Christ. And it's already happening. It's already happening. I, we have no number of Jews uh, that I know personally who are recent converts to Orthodoxy, and they've embraced the Messiah of the world and their own Messiah of the Jewish people. And glory be to Jesus Christ for that. What is your, the Orthodox perspective on the soul's creation? When two people get together to give birth, the soul is then created, then is created and now needs saving. Why then have babies if most won't be saved? I'm going to not answer that tonight because it's just beyond the pale and it's too. But I'll jot that down. I'll ask my coworkers to jot it down and we'll address it in the future. It's a pretty involved. But, you know, if we open these questions up and they're just all over the map and then I just answer piecemeal, it's not good. So I'd rather not answer something piecemeal. It's a, big, it's a big, good, and important topic, with, which deserves a good and extensive answer. Um, yeah. No. The, the answer is no. <laughs> the question is, is the rapture biblical? We've answered this multiple times. That rapture is not biblical. It is delusional. And it's a very recent doctrine. Thank you, Justin, for reminding me. We did not have a mixing board on this whole time. So you've been listening to me from a bad... It's too bad. Oh, oh. There you go. Too bad. I'm sorry about that. I got to have the mixing board on. Now we should be heard. should be better, huh? Now you can hear me better. Too bad. Oh. I hope you can all... You can hear me, hear me all very well before, nonetheless. All right. We have answered 38 or 40 questions. And we're going on two hours and 39 minutes. Do we have any more questions over in Crowdcast? We do not. All right. All right, folks. What about tomorrow night? Tomorrow night we'll be back for another lesson in the mystery of Christ. Another lesson in the mystery of Christ. 
Bradley says that sounds incredible. <laughs> yeah. Too bad I didn't have that on the whole lecture. That was one of my, one of the most important lectures I think I've ever given. I think it is. I think it's a really important topic and I didn't have the mic on. That's too bad. Uh it wasn't too bad before. That's good. Bradley asks, so are the end times just anyone can die at any moment? No, no. Bradley, you need to join us uh, every Tuesday. I've done 65 lectures on the book of Revelation on the basis of Elder Athanasius Peter Daniels' lectures, and he answers everything. And uh, the end times are real. There's real end times, and the end times begin with the first at the end of this first coming to the second coming. The entire history of the church is the end times, and they're the end of the end times with the coming of Antichrist and all the things and the many signs we see of those times approaching today. Uh, and uh, there is not, not just the death of each person. God bless you, House of Contempl Contemplation. Uh, and uh, I hope you're coming back and join us and join us. Um, become a member. Mystery of Christ tomorrow. Mystery of Christ tomorrow. Let me put it on the screen, everybody who wants to be a part of the, this wonderful catechism coming from Mount Athos, right there. The Mystery of Christ. Let me get that off the screen. Uh, the Athenite Catechism, ready to go tomorrow night, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And we're going to be looking at, let me give you the full table of contents for tomorrow night. One second. We're going to be looking at tomorrow night the God seer's quest for the face of God, the lawgiver, Christ as the lawgiver, the vision of the prophet Isaiah, and the ancient of days. Hopefully, all those four sections we will get to tomorrow night. And we are looking at the theophanies of the fleshless word, Logos, before he became flesh, speaking as the creator. In the hospitality of Abraham, the sacrifice of Abraham, the revelations of Jacob, the unconcerned, the burning but unconsumed bush, all of the many theophanies in the Old Testament. We're going through those one by one. Next week, we'll look at the, the one who preserved the three youths in the furnace and other manifestations of the word. And then in two weeks' time, uh, let's see, in two weeks' time, we're not going to, we have a, we have the 18th of March, we'll not have a lesson. I'm not sure if that's two weeks or three. In any case, I think I think it's three. Um, uh, there will no there will be no class on that Thursday, the eighteenth of of uh, April. I'll be absent, but otherwise uh, we'll, we'll go on to look at the types, symbols, and prefigurements. And indeed, we'll start with Adam, Abel, or, uh, and Seth, uh, and we'll go uh, through all of the uh, types in the Old Testament, and then we'll go on. And that'll be going on for the next year. So join us, become a member on one of those platforms that I mentioned. We got orthodoxethos.com. You can be a member there. Sign up there, get all the access to everything we've done. Patreon.com slash FR Peter Hears, all the Crowdcast lectures there. You can join us on YouTube, become a member and get everything through the YouTube channel or Instagram. Instagram, more limited. It's much more limited uh, just because the platform's limited. But we hope you join us tomorrow night. And then again, next Tuesday, we'll continue with the um, Book of Revelation every Tuesday. What should I do if, the, if there is no Orthodox Church near me that speaks my language? Go to the one that doesn't. Be in the presence of God. Pray and seek the face of God, no matter what and how it's secondary. You seek God. God is present in the divine liturgy. If you can go to a divine liturgy that's in English, do it. If you can't, do it, no matter what. What can we do? That's just the way, the way it is. We can talk about that. Why? Historically, all the rest. Uh, we've answered that already. Let's see. Twilight of the Gods. Interesting. I believe more and more that the good God is the God of the New Testament. But I know that if I reject the Old Testament, I will enter heresy. In short, how should I position myself regarding this? You should join us on every Thursday and look at the good God, the one and only God, the God, the Logos, the
the fleshless logos appearing and working and teaching throughout the Old Testament and get rid of this idea there's a bad God and a good God in the scriptures. There's only one God. Join us every Thursday and go back and watch the first six or whatever it is we've done and then keep coming because it'll disabuse you of that ancient heresy. The idea that there's some other God in the Old Testament, that is a heresy that's been rejected in the Gnostic heresy the old of the old uh, old world. Let's see. All right. Anything else? I think we're up to like 44 questions. I think that's a record. Or maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, I think we're done. Thank you very much. God bless you. I hope you join us, like I said, on those platforms. Join us over at uncommountainpress.com. We've got a ton of books over there. If you haven't read this book, Apostles I Hear, phenomenal book about the missionary from Mount Athos that went to the heart of Africa. And what an example he is. I wish, that's a book I translated about 20 years ago. This is my PhD thesis. If you're a former, if you're a papal Protestant or interested in orthodoxy from that tradition, and you want to know what's the orthodox view of the ecclesiology of Second Vatican Council, that's the book you want to read. That's available at uncommonpress.com. We got this new book in, In Defense of St. Cyprian, and how... The Jesuits are the ones who introduced this idea that St. Cyprian is not accepted by the ecumenical councils, and St. Raphael refutes that. Also, very important book for everybody. We just mentioned it. Our friend from France is trying to tra translate this book into French, wants to translate it into French. This book is essential reading for everybody who's coming to the Orthodox Church and wants to know what is the patristic teaching and how I should be received into the Orthodox Church by baptism, by chrismation, by confession of faith. Uh, am I already Orthodox? Even if I'm baptized in the heterodox, what is it? This is the book. 450 pages, 700 footnotes, presents the whole history of the question from Uncom Mountain Press. Go check it out. And then also, of course, this tome, 1,050 pages just out. Yesterday, as of yesterday, the soft cover is now in circulation. Hard, hard cover is available. The Orthodox Patristic Witness Concerning Catholicism. If you're coming from Catholicism or interested in it, the Orthodox Patristic Witness for the last thousand years on what is Catholicism, this is your book you're going to want to read. All right. God bless everybody. We'll see you soon. Glad you joined us. Forgive us. I don't think we have any for I, This always happens. Is I, I go to, to click off, and then there's like one more question. There it is. I knew there would be one more question. <laughs> Have you tried G chat GPT translate your books? No, and we're not going to. We refuse to use any AI, not only because we don't think it's accurate, because we don't want to support AI personally. I know that sounds old-fashioned, but at this point, that's where we're at. We're not going to embrace it. Thank you, though, for the, for the suggestion, but it's been a question we've debated. We're not going to go there. Father, can you explain? Thank you for the donation once again. Can you explain a little bit more about the economy of salvation? Thank you. Thank you, Evgeny. The economy of salvation, economia de soterias. What is the economy of salvation? That is the economy here. It means the plan, the working out, the providence of God, how he works out our salvation. That's what that means, right? So he had a plan from beginning, from the very beginning before time. He had a plan for humanity, his own son, to incarnate the whole nine yards from Beginning to end, from the first to the second coming, the ascension, everything is the that's the economy of salvation. And all the working out through 2,000 years of church history and how he works in history to save and redeem through a historical events. That's the he's the God of history, and he's working out salvation in the midst of the earth. This is the economy of salvation and how he chooses to save us. There's the akrivia, the exactitude of that, the revelation. It's come down to us, the teaching of the fathers. And then there's his own economy that departs from that norm, that I wouldn't say norm, but that exactitude. And that's where we have all of the canon, the canonical literature of the church comes and says, here's how you apply this in time and space for these circumstances and how this is all worked out. But it's the same Christ, the same salvation, and everything returns to his goodwill, his good pleasure. That's where it all ends up if it's salvation, right? It's not, does not remain in the realm of the exception. Exception 
is not the norm. It doesn't, we don't go there. We don't be, make it the norm. Like chrismation can never be the norm. It can never be the standard. It can never be the, the, the way things are done, right? In terms of reception, for instance, it's an, ex, it's an exception. It's, it, it's a, it's a departure from the acrivia, the exactitude as which, which God laid down for us. So all of that is a part of the economy. So without the economy, for instance, with regard to the question of the Holy Spirit, his procession, right? That's the economy. It's talking about when he says Christ sends the Spirit. He's talking about the economic trinity. That's what it's called, right? That's the how it's worked out in time and space. That's not the eternal or th the theology of the Holy Trinity, right? That's with regard to his eternal procession. And that's what the Lord's talking about in the Scriptures when he talks about the eternally proceeds from the Father. That's what's in the creed. That's why the filioque is a heresy, because it confuses this eternal procession and the relationship of the Trinity. And it, it identifies the economy and theology, or the economic Trinity, in other words, the sending of the Spirit in time and space, with the eternal manifest, uh, relationships of the Holy Trinity. All right now I'm getting off topic, but giving you an idea of what we're talking about economy, we're talking about how it's worked out, how it's revealed uh, in time and space for our salvation. Um, all right. Okay, one more. We're going to do one more. This never ends. Any truth to Thomas Burton? I don't know what that means. Did he ever speak truth? I mean, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure he said a lot of true things in the realm of ideas. Uh, but what are, you, what are you asking exactly? Are you asking, is he a true teacher, a representative of the truth of the gospel and of the fathers? No. And he ended up tragically dying in the Eastern religions and embracing in some level or another things that were really not a part of the holy tradition. So he's not an example for us as Orthodox Christians. We should not read him uh, for divine enlightenment. He didn't follow the Holy Fathers, and it's, it, his life became a tragedy. Did he say a lot of true things? Possibly. I haven't read much of him, to tell you the truth. Uh, I recommend Father Sarah from Rose, letter to Father Thomas Merton. Read that. Father Sarah from Rose's letter to Thomas Merton, you can find it online. It's in an old issue of the of the uh, Orthodox Word. It's very instructive as to the problems in contemporary Catholicism of which he is a part, unfortunately, or was. God help him. I uh, wish nothing bad for any him or anybody else. Just have to say that he doesn't represent the patristic tradition in in certain ways. Um, in the, the little that I know about him, all right, okay, and as a as a non Orthodox papal protestant monk he wasn't in communion with the church which is a tragedy okay god bless you all we'll see you soon good night <laughs>